Okay, good morning and welcome uh, to the 20th meeting in 2014 of the Finance Committee of the Scottish Parliament. Could I please just ask everyone present to please turn off any mobile phones or other electronic devices. Our first item of business this morning is to decide whether to take items 6 and 7 in private. Are the members agreed? Yes. Members have indicated their agreement. Our second item of business today is to take evidence from John Swinney, Cabinet Secretary of Finance, Employment and Sustainable Growth, on the nominees for appointment to the Scottish Fiscal Commission. The Cabinet Secretary is accompanied for this item by Alison Cumming, Head of Tax Policy at the Scottish Government, and I'd like to welcome both to the meeting this morning. Okay. Um, can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening statement? Uh, thank you, Convener. I'm pleased to discuss my nominations for appointment to the Scottish Fiscal Commission with the Committee this morning. Scrutiny, review and discussion of the nominations is an important process in establishing the Commission's credibility and independence. I believe it is very much in line with what the committee envisaged when they included the suggestion in the report in February. It is also in line with what I envisaged in accepting that proposal. I believe that there is widespread consensus across the Parliament that the creation of the Scottish Fiscal Commission is an important and welcome addition to Scotland's fiscal framework. The Commission will play a key role in scrutinising and reporting on tax forecasts prepared by the Scottish Government. I am strongly of the view that the Commission can only fulfil this role effectively if it is both independent of the Scottish Government and seen and understood to be so. Given that view, I take the independence of the prospective members of the Commission very seriously. As I confirmed in my letter of the 6th of June, I gave full consideration to the potential for conflicts of interest to arise or be reasonably perceived to arise between the membership of the Commission and other roles and offices held by the nominees. This includes membership of the Council of Economic Advisers, which the Committee made specific reference to in its letter to me of the 4th of June. I would like to take this opportunity to set out why I am satisfied that no conflicts of interest exist between membership of the Scottish Fiscal Commission and membership of the Council of Economic Advisers. My first point relates to the status of the Council of Economic Advisers, which is an independent group which provides advice to the First Minister on the Scottish economy. The political and professional independence of individual members of the Council of Economic Advisers is protected and fully respected. Susan Rice and Professor Hughes Hallett have each provided assurance on this point in the course of both their written evidence to the committee and during their pre-appointment hearings. Susan Rice demonstrated to the committee that the CEA put appropriate procedures in place to protect her independence. She and the Bank of England were satisfied with the procedures to address any actual or perceived conflict of interest between her membership of the Council of Economic Advisers and her role on the court of the Bank of England. My second point relates to the roles of the Council of Economic Advisers and the Scottish Fiscal Commission. I strongly believe that these do not conflict. The Council of Economic Advisers and the Scottish Fiscal Commission have two entirely different roles and remits. The Commission will be engaged in the technical scrutiny of revenue forecasts, which will draw on the members' understanding of economic and financial data trends and assumptions. The work of the CEA focuses on recovering jobs internationalisation and economic levers. The CEA will have no role in the forecasting process, which will be undertaken exclusively by the Scottish Government and will be scrutinised exclusively by the Scottish Fiscal Commission. There is no intention that the Commission will review work undertaken by the CEA or vice versa. To further assure the independence of Commission members, I have proposed that the Chair and members should be subject to a Code of Conduct based on the Model Code of Conduct for Members of devolved public bodies, which was approved by Parliament in December 2013. The Code deals with all aspects of conduct, including the registration and declaration of interests. This should provide the Committee with further assurance that the Chair and members will be held to the highest standards of conduct. I would, of course, be very happy to share this material with the Committee for its consideration. Finally, Convener, I would like to record my view that I have nominated three highly respected, skilled and authoritative individuals to serve on the Commission. I believe that Susan Rice and Professors Leith and Hughes Hallett would bring a strong set of skills and experience to bear on the work of the Commission. I think the Committee has direct evidence of the calibre of the nominees from their written evidence and the hearings on the 28th of May and the 4th of June. Uh, I am pleased to have this opportunity to discuss my nominations with the Committee this morning and to answer any questions that the Committee may have. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'll obviously start by asking a couple of questions and I'll move on to open the session out to uh, colleagues around the table. Um, in in um, his um, 
In response to questions that Professor Hughes Hallett said, and I quote, it's difficult to imagine how somebody who's independent can have a conflict of interest because he would not then be independent. The Council is not beholden to anyone, nor do I imagine the Commission would be anyway. I would not want to be. And he also talks about um, the, the two organisations being sequential and their roles being complementary. Is, is that how you see it, Cabinet Secretary? I see the roles of the um, Council of Economic Advisers and the Fiscal Commission being uh, entirely distinct and separate convener. Um, when I came to the uh, committee on previous occasions, when we were prior to the publication of the committee's report on this subject, and indeed after the publication of the committee's report on this subject, um, I established a, a, what I hope was a very clear line of argument that the Scottish Fiscal Commission would be looking essentially at the forecasting of taxes that were being devolved as a consequence of the Scotland Act 2012. And there was, a, I suppose, a, a, you know, a part of debate as part of the committee's evidence gathering on this whole process as to whether the Scottish Fiscal Commission should have a wider remit than that. And I quite acknowledge that there was different voices um, outside of Parliament, indeed some within the committee, that thought the Fiscal Commission should have a broader remit than undertaking the scrutiny of the forecasting of uh, new taxes. Um, that was not my view, and I didn't set the Scottish Fiscal Commission up to rival um, or compete with any other sources of economic discussion or deliberation. I set up the Scottish Fiscal Commission, and if you let me quote from the official report of the 8th of January, uh, convener, um, uh, if we give the Commission too broad a remit beyond the forecasting of the taxes that have been devolved to Scotland as a consequence of the Scotland Act 2012, we will create the opportunity for intrusion into the responsibilities of other bodies. Um, so my view has been absolutely crystal clear that the role of the Fiscal Commission is to scrutinise the forecast that I bring forward um, to, as part of the budget process, and that is the, um, the extent of their responsibility. And the Council of Economic Advisers, the Council of Economic Advisers, will have no involvement in that process. Okay, thank you very much for that full answer. Uh, Professor Hughes Hallett, in his response uh, um, to questions, said that he didn't foresee there would be a conflict of interest, but if there was, he would say that that would lead to a parting of the ways. In terms of the Code of Conduct, is, is that something you would uh, agree with? What I think is clear from the, 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 the different experiences and responsibilities that have been undertaken by all, all three applicants uh, or nominees for the Scottish Fiscal Commission, um, is that all of them have undertaken um, a range of projects, um, developments, initiatives, roles, responsibilities for a variety of different organisations, some of them at the same time. And I think the three very distinguished individuals that I have nominated to serve on the Fiscal Commission I think by the fact that they've been able to undertake all of these roles in the past, have demonstrated an ability to properly handle um, any issues that might arise or be perceived to arise in relation to potential conflict of interest. So um, I think bluntly, convener, you don't end up with a CV like the CVs of the three individuals that are before the committee today um, without being able to properly manage the independence and integrity uh, that these individuals bring to the work that they undertake. And I would, uh, that is ex exactly what I would expect of them in relation to their participation in the Scottish Fiscal Commission. I mean, Professor Hughes Hallett talked about being approached by, mem by representatives of all four main uh, UK or Scottish parties, I should say, in terms of uh, uh, providing impartial advice. And uh, uh, I think all the witnesses talked about the issues of integrity and independence of mind and ability to uh, act uh, and give advice uh, in that manner. Um, but one of the things that's came up from colleagues on the committee is the issue of perception, because um, you know, two of the three members would be me members of the two different bodies, the Council of Economic Advisers and the, 
the Commission? How do you deal with the issue of perception? Because I think that's very much at the heart of the deliberations this morning. I, I think the, the issue of perception is dealt with by the fact that I have made absolutely clear that the roles and responsibilities of the Scottish Fiscal Commission and the Council of Economic Advisers are entirely separate. So there will be um, no discussion at the Council of Economic Advisers that will encroach on the remit and the responsibility of the members of the Scottish Fiscal Commission, which will be to scrutinise the um, forecast that I put forward in relation to the devolved taxes and in relation to non-domestic rates income as part of the remit that I have set out for the Commission. So it's a, it's a technical evaluation of the, um, the estimates that I have put forward um, for the Commission to consider and to, um, well, I would hope uh, to endorse, but uh, clearly if they didn't endorse them, then uh, I would have to reconsider the forecast that I had made. Thank you for that. I'm going to open up the session to colleagues around the table. And the first person to ask questions will be Jamie, to be followed by Michael. Thank you. It could be the Cabinet Secretary and uh, their written responses to the questions that uh, the committee sent uh, to them. Uh, Susan Rice said that she was asked to join the Council of Economic Advisers in 2011 and agreed to do that only if my political independence would be protected at all times. Uh, this restriction was accepted well, and she would say. Andrew Hughes Harlett says, uh, I am a member of uh, the, Earth, the Scottish Government's uh, Council of Economic Advisers on the condition that my independence would be protected. Do you think we should take that uh, in good faith and accept that we will act independently as members of the Scottish Fiscal Commission as well? Uh, I, I think these are, these are fair and representative statements by Susan Rice and Andrew Hughes Hallett. Um, the Council of Economic Advisers has been um, established to provide advice to the First Minister on the Scottish economy. Um, the members participate in that uh, willingly and voluntarily. They do so with the very clear proviso that their independence is utterly protected and respected. And uh, in all of my observation of the Council of Economic Advisers, um, that has been uh, the approach that has been taken. That, that leads me neatly on to the, the next point, because uh, in response to Mr uh, Brown, uh, Professor Hughes Hallett said, and the convener has highlighted this uh, as well, he said, the Council is not holding to anybody, nor do I imagine the Commission would be anybody I would not want to be. I mean, is that your understanding of how the, the Council of Economic Advisers works, how you envisage the, the Scottish Fiscal Commission working? Uh, of course, and the Fiscal Commission has been established with... Um, if, in terms of looking at the, 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 the factors that weighed in my mind in making the recommendations to the committee, um, I wanted to have um, a, a group of individuals who would have very strong technical expertise to be able to effectively challenge the work that is done within government to establish these forecasts of new taxes. Um, I didn't uh, want to establish a, 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 a general commentary body. I wanted to establish a body with, uh, of people who would have the correct perspective to be able to challenge what the government was setting forward and to be able to give a reassurance to Parliament if they were endorsing the, the, the estimates that I had made, that these were made on sound, a sound basis and a justifiable basis. And if they were not, to be able to marshal to Parliament the reasons why my estimates and forecasts were not sufficient. Uh, so the, 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 the three nominees were designed to reflect that um, essential requirement in what Parliament would expect of a Scottish Fiscal Commission. And uh, I, I've said to the committee already that the, you know, I've set out initial thinking on the resources that would be available to the Fiscal Commission. I've established it um, away from government, established under the auspices of the University of Glasgow to put distance between the government and the Fiscal Commission. Uh, I've put in the caveat that if the Commission, and I think the committee's gone over this ground with the, the, the nominees as well, um, if the 
figure of £20,000 worth of resources that I've put in place is not sufficient, then that will be revisited. And I, I you know, clearly must have an open mind on that question. And we obviously advise the committee if I came to uh, the necessity to, to change that, that number. So in all of these respects, the Commission is being set up um, to exercise that independent judgment, independent in itself and independent from any other um, work that any other individuals may be associated with. Now, if I if I look at the the respective um, uh, uh, CVs of the the candidates involved in their biographies, um, Professor Leith has actually been one of the principal individuals explaining and arguing um, the rationale for setting up independent fiscal bodies. In, in his academic life. Um, uh, that approach is reflected also in the um, biography of Professor Hughes Hallett, who has had, and his work is extensive around the world, about the role of fiscal commissions and how they must be robust and challenging to government. And Susan Rice is an individual who has served in a whole variety of private and public sector roles um, and you know, most recently in the court of the Bank of England, able to exercise that degree of independent judgment and challenge. So these are these are individuals for in whom I think we should have a great deal of confidence, and um, that they are able to exercise that distinctive judgment that Parliament expects of them in relation to the fiscal commission. You've talked um, about the different roles of the Council of Economic Advisers and the. Fiscal Commission and uh, in a letter to uh, the uh, convener you uh, set out that the Council of Economic Advisors will not have a role in the forecasting process, furthermore, nor will it or the Commission take a view on setting rates for the devolved uh, taxes. Can you, you set out how this in particular protects the independence of, of both bodies and stops a, a conflict of interest arising? It works on, on the basis, convener, that um, uh, I will take a decision um, I'm obviously exploring these questions just now uh, in relation to the 2015-16 uh, budget of the rates and bans that will be applied. That will be my judgment. I will not be taking any um, input from the Council of Economic Advisers in that process or from the Fiscal Commission. That will be my judgment. I'm the Finance Minister. I've got to exercise these judgments. Parliament expects that of me. Um, they will be signed off by the Cabinet um, as part of the budget process. And we will make estimates of what we think will be generated as a consequence of these tax rates and tax bans. Um, those estimates will be um, will be uh, sub submitted to the Scottish Fiscal Commission um, with due time and due opportunity for the Scottish Fiscal Commission um, in its own time and its own responsibilities to scrutinise those estimates that I have uh, proposed and to either tell me that I've made a reasonable set of assumptions or that I've got to go back and think again. But adequate time will be given to the Fiscal Commission to enable it to uh, come to either conclusion. Just uh, finally, uh, I mean, you've, you've uh, proposed the, 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 and you've talked about the, this in your opening statement, Cameron said that you proposed that those members appointed to the, the Commission it should operate under a and be subject to a code of conduct. Can you just tell us a, a little bit more uh, about this and, uh, again, how it will deal with issues of, of conflict of interest in particular? The code of conduct um, is the model code of conduct for members of devolved public bodies. Um, it was um, approved by Parliament in December 2013. It essentially provides guidance for um, individuals who are members of devolved public bodies around their general conduct, the registration of interest, the declaration of interest, the, uh, the things they've got to watch out for in relation to um, perceptions of a, a influence from external factors about lobbying and access to members of public bodies. And um, it goes through all of those questions. And, of course, it's, it's always been subject to parliamentary scrutiny, which um, certainly gives me confidence that it's been applied to a very robust um, standard of, uh, uh, of scrutiny. And uh, I would uh, essentially see that being the 
the code that would be used to regulate um, any issues in connection with the membership of the Scottish Fiscal Commission by its members. You, you feel this enhances transparency and crucially is uh, the code itself is subject to, to parliamentary scrutiny? Well, well? Parliament has approved it so I, and it's approved it very recently so I can only believe that Parliament considers that to be um, the appropriate code to be in place at the present time and I think it provides uh, further guidance and further reassurance to Parliament that the highest standards are being applied in the constitution of the Scottish Fiscal Commission. Thank you. Thank you. Michael, to be followed by Gavin. Thank you, Convener. Um, Cabinet Secretary, I'd like to pre preface my question by accepting absolutely the, the credentials of the three uh, nominees that you've put forward. They're estimable um, figures in, in the field in which they operate, and we should have the utmost confidence in their ability to do that job. But would you agree that's not really the question that we're here to consider? That the, the problem uh, is that in all of the evidence that we took, and we, we took extensive evidence um, as a committee looking into the, the establishment of a fiscal commission, that the matter of independence uh, of that body seemed to be a given that the individuals concerned were independent of government and that we could rely on, on that fact. And that's really the crux of, of the problem. Um, you gave the example of uh, Lady Rice being on the, the court of the Bank of England and also on your Council of Economic Advisers. But do you not concede that they are two entirely separate entities over which there are different auspices and the appointments are different? And that what we really have here is a concern that the Council of Economic Advisers and the Independent Fiscal Commission are both appointed by the Scottish Government, and that's where the, the perception of a potential problem comes. The first thing I'd like to say is that I welcome what Mr McMahon said at the start of his question, because I think that's a helpful contribution to this discussion, because I think it puts beyond peradventure that the individuals are of significant strength and capability and I think it's important in the process because these individuals have um, well they've not quite volunteered for parliamentary scrutiny but certainly I've invited them to go through parliamentary scrutiny and um, and that's I think that's a, you know that's a particularly welcome willing contribution they've been prepared to make so I, I welcome what Mr McMahon has said at the outset of his, his question. In relation to the second part of his question, um, I, I, I think through all of my evidence to the committee, I have made clear the importance that I attach to the independence of the Scottish Fiscal Commission. So I've gone to um, significant lengths to establish that into its, um, its whole founding ethos, um, where it will be located, how it will be supported, uh, the, the distance from government. I've also said that the members of the Scottish Fiscal Commission will only ever be appointed for one term. So they'll never have to come back to me for reappointment. Never. Because they are there to, you know, so that nobody's worried about, well, what if I say this this year? I might not get reappointed. They won't have to come back to me for reappointment ever. It's one of the founding parts of what I've put into the organisation of the Fiscal Commission. I think that's entirely correct as a step. And the other point I would make is that the role of the Fiscal Commission um, is completely different and separate from the role of the Council of Economic Advisers. The Council of Economic Advisers will have absolutely nothing to do with the scrutiny of the forecast tax receipts on land and buildings transaction tax, landfill tax or non-domestic rates income. And if the committee requires further reassurance on this point, I shall make it absolutely crystal clear that the, the Council of Economic Advisers cannot consider any issues in relation to that, if that helps the committee in making that distinction. Um, because uh, I have been in, you know, Mr McMahon and I had an exchange um, in a discussion on the 8th of January where um, Mr McMahon was um, essentially um, inviting me to confirm that the Fiscal Commission would have a very tight remit, focused entirely on, on the forecasts. And I was able to confirm that 
in the exchanges that Mr McMahon and I had back on the 8th of January, and I stand by that, because there is a distinct a task being undertaken here. Um, the individuals have got to apply themselves to that irrespective of other perspectives and interests they may have. And my point, which I think I made earlier to the convener, was that the individuals have um, biographies which, and, and Mr McMahon's essentially accepted this point by his first generous remark, that um, the individuals have biographies that have been built up by protecting their independence, being able to work for different bodies, different institutions, but utterly protecting their independence. And there is, uh, there is absolutely nothing that these arrangements that uh, I wish to put in place will do to jeopardise that. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. Uh, I do recall the, the discussion we had in, in January. and I also am very much aware that all of that was, was done in the context. It, would, it never occurred to, to me, certainly, that we would be talking about the same people sitting on two different bodies appointed by the Scottish Government. It just never occurred, or we'd have raised that question at the time. And really the point for me is that when Lady Rice was asked the question about potential conflicts of interest and perceptions of conflicts of interest, as Professor Hughes Hallett did, and yourself indeed, Cabinet Secretary, when you wrote to us, and, and again this morning, you've talked about dealing with the issues should it arise. But surely the point is there should be no potential conflict of interest. And if we can foresee a potential conflict of interest, then that perception is already there. And surely that then is, is the crux of the, the problem at, at the outset. Well, I, I, I don't see how a conflict of interest can arise. Um, I don't see how a conflict of interest can arise because, firstly, um, I have appoint, nominated three individuals of um, significant independent credentials, and, uh, and Mr McMahon has accepted that point in his remarks this morning. Secondly, I have indicated that the role of the Scottish Fiscal Commission is completely separate from the Council of Economic Advisers, and I will not tolerate any fusion of their remits. Thirdly, the members of the Scottish Fiscal Commission are appointed for one term and one term only. They will be beholden to me for once I've once if Parliament approves their nominations. They're not beholden to me in any respect. They are free to say what they like about my forecasts. And they will never have to come back to me for reappointment because I think that interrupts or undermines their independence. So I think in those three examples, I would um, say to Mr McMahon and the committee that I do not see any potential for a conflict of interest to arise. But I do accept the caveat that if a perceived conflict of interest was to arise, we would remedy that, but I do not foresee how that could emerge because I certainly will make it um, absolutely clear that the Council of Economic Advisers has no um, involvement in the forecasting or the scrutiny of what well, certainly have no involvement in the forecasting because that's my business as the Finance Minister and it will have no involvement in the scrutiny of those forecasts um, because that is the exclusive preserve of the Fiscal Commission. And one of the other points that I would just highlight from my um, earlier um, evidence to the committee, um, when I and, and I've referred to this one already, uh, this point already, is that I wanted to avoid by by giving the, the Fiscal Commission a very clear and focused remit. I wanted to avoid the opportunity for intrusion into the responsibility responsibilities of other bodies and. So the, the, it is it's a significant point of reassurance to the committee that the Fiscal Commission um, it will not have its responsibilities or its territory intruded upon by anybody, and equally it will not do likewise to any other body. Does the Cabinet Secretary not concede that having two distinct and separate remits is not the same as having two distinct and separate people on either of the, the, the bodies? And that's where the perception becomes the problem. That the only way that you can absolutely guarantee that there's no potential conflict of interest is to have different people 
on the two different bodies. I, I don't accept that point because, uh, as I've said to the committee already, if I look at the, um, the, the biographies of the individuals that I have nominated, they are all individuals who have managed to work for a variety of different bodies. The convener made the point that Professor Hughes Hallett, for example, has advised all four main political parties in the United Kingdom. Well, you know, he must be able to uh, provide advice in a fashion that commands confidence amongst um, the various political parties. And, uh, uh, and as I've said already, um, Susan Rice has um, successfully managed um, any circumstance where there may have been a perceived conflict of interest between uh, the different roles that she has taken forward as part of a very wide and varied career. So um, I think individuals are, uh, are, are, are per of, of this calibre are perfectly capable of managing um, any potential issues that could lead to the perception of a conflict of interest. Uh, Malcolm, uh, sorry, Gavin, to be followed by Malcolm. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll also start by saying that I think I agree entirely uh, with the Cabinet Secretary when he talked about the high calibre and the skill levels of all three of his nominations here. Um, I agree with that 100%. Uh, the issue for me is about the perception of a conflict of interest. Now, the Cabinet Secretary said clearly he doesn't think a conflict exists. I think you sounded a little less clear on the question of perception. Is it your view there is no perception of a conflict of interest between somebody, between a body advising government on economic levers and at the same time scrutinising government on the use and the forecasts of those economic levers? I, I see no ground for a perception of a conflict of interest in that respect because these are two entirely different things. Um, the Fiscal Commission will not be providing me with advice on how I might exercise the fiscal levers. They will be providing Parliament with an assurance that the estimates that I have made on the calculation of tax receipts from land and buildings, transaction tax, landfill tax, non-domestic rates income will be, you know, are, are soundly based. And uh, those are, uh, and that's a, a technical process, looking at economic modelling and um, modelling of tax take and the assumptions that we use in that process. And um, it is not in any way, uh, shape or form, uh, related to policy development or uh, the manner in which economic levers have been exercised. So you're saying that the Council of Economic Advisers at no time have given you advice or suggestions on how tax levers might or might not be used? That's not what I said. Um, what I'm saying is that the Fiscal Commission has a very specific remit to consider technically the tax forecast that I am making in relation to those uh, relevant taxes. That is the function of the Scottish Fiscal Commission and at no stage will the Council of Economic Advisers, under any circumstance, be involved in any way in that process. But have the Council of Economic Advisers, or could they potentially give you advice on the use of taxes? I cannot recall any incident where the Council of Economic Advisers has given the government any advice on the exercise of tax powers? Uh, no, never. Uh, you know, I, I, I can't recall. Uh, you know, there may well be um, uh, something that I can't recall today in response to that question, but I, at this stage I can't recall it. I want to just explore what, what the Council of Economic Advisers do, because while the Commission may well be set up as an independent body if there are individuals simultaneously serving on both. To me, there is at least a question of a perception of a conflict. Um, how regular are the engagements between the Council of Economic Advisers and the Chief Econ Economist's Office outside of formal meetings? 
um, there will be um, discussions from time to time between the Chief Economic Advisor and members of the Council of Economic Advisors uh, in between meetings of the Council, and the Council generally meets a um, couple of times a year. Sorry, I mean, yeah, obviously the, the, the minutes are, of the meetings are, are put online, but in terms of when you say there, there will be meetings from time to time outside of the formal meetings, do you have a, a rough idea of the, the regularity? Yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll happen from time to time. They're not, there's, not a, there's not a set programme. If there's issues that the Council of Economic Advisors is working on, then they will take forward, uh, they'll take forward that discussion with the, uh, you know, with the Office of the Chief Economic Advisor um, or any other officials within government. You know, what the Council does, for example, um, you know, let's take an example on, um, uh, on childcare, for example, where the Council was involved in these, uh, in these issues. The council would also interact with um, officials of the government who are nothing to do with the chief economic advisor's uh, function, but will be policy specialists in that area. Okay. Um, when you discussed the draft budget at the Council of Economic Advisors, how in depth was that discussion? It, that would be at the level of me setting out that the government's priorities would be around focusing on capital investment, max maximising capital investment to support economic recovery. Uh, they would be on the reform of public services and the focus on the person-centred approach that the government is taking forward. And they would be focused on our um, actions to uh, fulfil our commitments in relation to uh, climate change or equalities issues or questions of that type. Did business rates feature at all in that discussion from any member? No. Okay. Um, I want to look now at the OECD rules, because we've obviously, as a committee, signed up to all 22 of those OECD rules. Um, rule 2.1 talks about avoiding even the perception of any independence or partisanship. It's still your view there could be no perception whatsoever of a conflict between the two roles being held at the same time? Uh, I, don't, I, don't, uh, I don't accept that, Camille. Uh, Mr. Wynne. It's another, th finally, if I may, Camille, just the, another issue that's dropped up. Again, it relates to the perception uh, of a conflict or a lack of independence. Some comments have been made about uh, the OBR uh, by people uh, trying to suggest there is a lack of independence from government from there, as I suspect happens in other countries. Uh, you said quite specifically when you gave evidence to this committee in January, uh, the OBR is an example of the more limited number of cases in which an independent fiscal commission constructs the forecast itself. However, given that that arrangement operates on the basis of secondment from the Treasury to the OBR, there is a justifiable degree of scepticism about how far from government the office is. Do you not think that you have effectively challenged the independence of another fiscal body by that statement? It, no, I haven't. Um, I think the issue about um, the, the, uh, the OBR is, you know, is that um, essentially it's, it's staffed by secondees from the Treasury. The Scottish Fiscal Commission will not be staffed by secondees from the Scottish Government. I've set it up away from government. I've set it up in the University of Glasgow. I've set it up to say, you know, we'll send you the forecasts that we make. You know, the forecasts that were made by um, my finance officials, uh, worked on by my finance officials, they'll be worked on by the Office of the Chief Economic Advisors, and ultimately I will make a judgment based on those forecasts, and then we will send them to the Scottish Fiscal Commission which will be independent and removed from government. And uh, the Fiscal Commission is empowered by individuals who will never have to come to me for reappointment. They're not civil servants that will have to come back and work for me later on, have to worry about oh, what it will be like if we've got to go back and work for him later. Uh, they won't ever have to do that. Um, they'll never have to come back to me for reappointment. They're getting their single term to exercise this independent function. Okay, and finally then, Kavira, I mean, you, you, you've stated publicly scepticism about the independence of one fiscal body where members of that body are not simultaneously uh, providing advice to government through another body. 
Can you at least understand why there are some questions being raised by this committee and others outside there in the commentary um, about why there's a perception of a conflict when members, not staff, members of the body will be serving on both? Well, obviously, I understand uh, because I'm here. So <laughs> I'm here to respond to questions to the committee. So, of course, I understand it. I don't accept it um, because of all the issues that I've gone through already this morning. The Commission has been set up with single-term appointments, so nobody will have to come back to me for re-election, for reappointment, re-nomination. So there's no, you know, people can say what they like about my fiscal forecast. They'll never have to come back and ask for a reappointment from me. Um, secondly, the fiscal commission will be um, not staffed by government. Won't be seconded. There won't be a single secondee from the government in the fiscal commission. It's away in the University of Glasgow. Um, uh, and thirdly, uh, the and, and I've if I look through the evidence and I look through it all again in preparation for today of the line of argument that I've taken throughout this process, it has been that the Scottish Fiscal Commission should have a tight remit to uh, to, to to judge on the fiscal forecast that I make, not to go having remit creep into other areas of policy and activity. I specifically ruled that out, ruled that out consistently during the inquiry the committee has undertaken. So I think for all of those reasons there is sufficient reassurance that um, no potential conflict of interest arises. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Malcolm, to be followed by John. Uh, <coughs> you said uh, just now that you didn't see how a conflict of interest could arise, but clearly um, Lady Susan Wright uh, had given a great deal of thought to that and therefore uh, could envisage the possibility, and I, and I think the implication of what she said was at that point she would she would choose. Uh, I think she implied she would pick the, the fiscal commission as well. But given that, um, I mean, do you think you're right to be so absolutely sure that it's not possible that a conflict of interest could arise? I think I'm correct. Yes. So, in a sense, though, you you want to. Um, reinforce your position by, I think you suggested you would make it explicitly clear to the uh, Council of Economic Advisers that they should have no role in forecasting, but I don't know how, how wide that exclusion will become, because it, it, sh surely it, it's very um, restrictive for such a body not to be allowed to consider matters of fiscal policy, which are so crucial to economic and financial policy. So uh, you said you thought they hadn't given advice on taxes, but, but surely they could potentially. They might think that was very relevant to their rules. So you're almost being put in a position where you have to constrain their remit in order to protect your statement about a hard separation between the two rules. Well, can I, can I quote Convener from the official report of the session on the 8th of January? And again, this is territory that Mr Chisholm and I were uh, exchanging on at uh, column 3518 in which I said Mr Chisholm um, was um, raising with me the issue about a clear demarcation between um, Audit Scotland and the Scottish Fiscal Commission. And in my answer I said, I am simply saying that uppermost in my mind will be the need to avoid creating the conditions in which the body can move into territory that is properly the responsibility of organisations that we all accept have been properly constituted. To put that... What I'm trying to do there is to say that I am anxious to avoid a circumstance where the Scottish Fiscal Commission's responsibilities extend into other bodies, and equally um, that the Council of Economic Advisers does not creep into other areas of responsibility of other bodies. So um, I, I'm trying to set out there as clearly as I possibly can do that um, I don't want to see... Um, bodies intruding on the responsibilities of others, and I will, you know, I will make it absolutely expressly clear that that uh, that uh, well, I make it expressly clear to the committee that, that cannot be the case. So there could be some blurring at the edges, but if the Council of Economic Advisers wanted to talk about fiscal policy and what the consequences of certain taxation decisions might be. But my, my point is about the remit of the Scottish Fiscal Commission. The remit of the Scottish Fiscal Commission um, is to forecast 
the, the taxes that have been devolved to Scotland as a consequence of the Scotland Act 2012 and as a consequence of decisions I've taken on domestic rates income. That is the remit of the Scottish Fiscal Commission. No more. In a sense, I mean, I think my fundamental um, my puzzle, my puzzlement about this issue is that there are many eminent economists in Scotland, uh, an eminent professor sitting behind you now, uh, and we could have chosen, you could have chosen um, any one of a large number of figures. So I'm genuinely baffled why you would have picked uh, two, who are, two of the three who are already fulfilling a particular role when there are a large number of others you know, who would have not, who would have equally been accepted because of their um, competence, but would not have stirred up uh, this controversy. No doubt you'll be able to push this through with your majority, but you know a lot of people outside are already questioning it. It doesn't get the Fiscal Commission off to the best possible start. So why, and this, I, I'm genuinely puzzled, why would you seek to move into that controversial territory when you could have picked, I mean, we've had several before our committee in the last two months who I could think of um, would be eminently suitable for this role. I mean, perhaps I can just mention one Jeremy Peat, for example. And I just wonder why you then moved into controversial territory and picked uh, two that were already serving rather than uh, casting the net wider. Well, it certainly wasn't my plan to move into controversial territory. Uh, I have taken careful course throughout the whole of this inquiry to act in a fashion that um, could build as much consensus and agreement around the establishment of the Scottish Fiscal Commission. And if I look back at the evidence that, uh, the, uh, that I shared with the committee and that we discussed and the uh, approach to um, the handling of all these issues, uh, I don't think anybody could look at that evidence or the response to the Finance Committee report in any way to say that the government was doing anything other than working in the spirit of the Finance Committee's approach to establishing the Scottish Fiscal Commission as um, an entirely independent body of government. And my judgment about the individuals to, um, to, to be nominated has been driven by trying to ensure that we had, um, well, I'll, just, I'll go through the, the, the individual candidates and what formed my judgment about them. Um, firstly, on Susan Rice, uh, I made a judgment that Susan Rice was an individual of uh, significant distinction in the business community in Scotland who had exercised a number of independent and challenging roles, and particularly her experience on the court of the Bank of England, was uppermost in my mind as having um, a very strong element of independent, independent thinking being required in the process. Professor Campbell Leith was nominated because Professor Leith has been one of the key um, academics who have considered and explained and um, uh, and set out the basis upon which independent fiscal commissions can operate. And Professor Hughes Hallett um, has equally been one of the other key academics who have been involved in the uh, design of independent fiscal commissions across the globe, literally across the globe. And I judged that if we had that experience available to us and willing to participate, that was a reasonable conclusion to arrive at. Now, of course, of course, there are many other eminent um, academics or, co or commentators that could have been put on to an independent fiscal commission. Of course there are. Uh, but I made the judgments for entirely those reasons of ensuring that the fiscal commission was established on an independent footing with people of um, significant records who could contribute to that process. And I just say finally that, um, I, of course, there are other nominees I could have brought forward. But I think when you explore all this territory, the, you know, trying to get some individuals who could have absolutely no connection to absolutely anything that's gone on that couldn't be put into the slot of been saying, well, maybe they might be in certain circumstances conflicted, I think is, you know, 
I, you know, I, th I think that's impossible to rule out uh, in relation to a whole range of other nominees. There's only two bodies, really, one at present, the Council of Economic Advisers, and there'll soon be a second one that have this direct link to government economic and uh, financial policy. So, uh, you know, given the controversy, which you obviously think is unjustified, I mean, what would be the problem about asking members to choose? I think the implication of what Lady Susan Rice said was, I think that she's so committed to this role in the Fiscal Commission that she would choose that. I don't know what Andrew Hughes Hallett would choose, but... I don't really see why that would be such a big problem because uh, you would certainly, you know, have have other people to to fill whichever vacancy arose. And again, I suppose part of the controversy has been has arisen because I suppose certain people feel that you know that perhaps the government does have its favourite economists and there can be a, a too cosy relationship that develops with one or two individuals and it's actually better to spread that as far as possible because we know from our own evidence of the last two months that there's a range, a range of views and it's, 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 it's better to in fact let that uh, range of views be reflected in the different bodies. Well, let, let me just deal with that in two ways. The first is that um, the... Um, the, 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 the Fiscal Commission um, will have a very tight remit, which is about challenging the forecast that I make for a, a tax take from the various taxes. Um, it's a very, very tight and focused remit. It's not ranging across a whole range of other questions, as I said already. And the second point in relation to the government having its favourite economists, I, I, I only need to recall First Minister's question time, I think, a week past Thursday where the contribution of Professor Hughes Hallett was being used by the leader of the Conservative Party to suggest that he was somewhat at odds with the government. So I'm afraid I can't see how we can have it both ways. Well, I, th I think you will remember what answer the First Minister gave to that, but um, I don't really want to pursue that particular line of questioning. But do you not think um, it would be better in terms of independence to have a fiscal commission that was independent not just of the government, but of the Council of Economic Advisers. Well, I, I, I think I've put forward um, three eminent candidates who have built their reputations on being independent figures in this respect. Thank you, Deputy Convener. Uh, thanks, Convener. Um, yeah, I mean, you were kind of touching on in that last exchange um, about uh, you know the kind of people we're wanting, and we've had, I've just jotted down some of the things that have been said about the people we're looking for. Uh, which I don't think anyone's disputing. So we've had independent credentials, significant records, highly respected, skilled, authoritative, expertise, perspective. I mean, the bar's quite high. C can you give us an idea how big a pool that you think we're, we're drawing on? Presumably it's not thousands of people. I mean, another one I thought of was they'd have to know Scottish, the Scottish economy quite well, so that restricts it further. Uh, how, how big a pool are we talking about? I think there's a, there's a, a, a reasonably a comprehensive pool of individuals. Um, what you've also got to... So it's not, in, it's not in the thousands, no. It's not in the thousands, but... Uh, um, I'd say it's probably in the dozens, yes. Um, but you've also got to think about what these other people are doing. Some of them are literally... You know, wouldn't be able, because of other projects they're involved in, uh, to be able to give the time commitment to, to be involved in a whole variety of other... Um, considerations as to whether individuals would be prepared to do so, but uh, you know the, the, the pool is certainly um, is a substantial pool. Okay, but I mean the, to be in that pool, and I'm assuming it's dozens or scores or, or something along these lines. I mean th these people could not have empty lives outside of their current role, could they? I mean, and, and have zero history. I mean, presumably all of these people have complex histories and have presently a wide range of roles. Essentially, that's my, one of my core points, uh, Kavina, that um, individuals do not amass the biographies and the CVs of, the, of the, 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 the character that the three nominees before the committee have amassed. Um, if they've not done lots of things for lots of people and lots of bodies over time. And, uh, but the crucial point in all of this is that people do that whilst preserving their independence and that's what's at the heart of the nominations that I've made. I mean clearly the committee has concentrated on uh, the Council of Economic Advisers as a possible conflict of interest but you know there's other words have jumped out at me from CVs one being Kalman Commission. Now I mean immediately that sets 
orange and red lights and all sorts of things flashing for me uh, as a potential conflict. It, you know, it makes me think, is that person too close to the Labour Party or, or what, what does it mean? And I mean, to say somebody has had links with four of the parties, well, I mean, I'm not to know which ones it might be stronger with the Conservatives, might be stronger with Labour, might be stronger uh, with anybody. So it seems to me we're not looking at some kind of blank sheet of paper here, but it's, it is very about, much about how we manage it. I mean, it's been suggested already, Michael McMahon talked about no potential conflict of interest, and Gavin Brown talked about no perception, but especially perception is very subjective, isn't it? I mean, presumably anybody could perceive anything about anybody, almost, if you, if you take it to that kind of extreme conclusion. That, that's, that's undoubtedly possible. Um, but I think what I come back to is the answer I think I gave to um, Malcolm Chisholm about why I had arrived at the choice of these three particular individuals. Um, Susan Rice, because of her um, significant business leadership capability and particularly her role in the court of the Bank of England. Andrew Hughes Hallett and uh, Campbell Leith because of their technical expertise and the fact that they have been so instrumental in the design of fiscal commissions uh, across the globe. Um, these are important um, uh, contributions that I want to make sure are available to Scotland as we embark on uh, an entirely new area of, uh, of activity um, within the management of our public finances. In the Bank of England, I'm sure, is up for criticism, but it's also quite respected. And in some ways, I was surprised they allowed uh, Susan Rice to be involved in the Bank of England, but she actually said they were quite positive about that, being involved in the Council of Economic Advisers, as long as there were proper safeguards in place. Um, and, and she gave that as an example that could be replicated. So, I mean, is it your contention that that can be replicated? Because almost inevitably, somewhere along the line, somebody has a conflict of interest. Well, I think what, 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 I, what I've said to the committee today is that um, I, um, what I said in my letter to the committee was the point about um, the code of conduct. Um, I've also made clear to the committee that um, the, uh, I see the very clear and firm distinction between the remits of the Council of Economic Advisers and the Fiscal Commission providing um, uh, all of the distinctiveness to ensure that there is no conflict of interest. Um, but I, I return to my fundamental point. Uh, these individuals have worked for a whole variety of different organisations, different projects, different perspectives, different political parties, etc., etc., and they've protected their independence throughout. That's the nature and the calibre and the strength of the candidates we have in front of us. George. Okay, thank you very much. That has exhausted the questions from the committee. I'd like to thank the Cabinet Secretary and their colleagues for their contributions. Um, I uh, want to suspend for a minute in order to allow a changeover of officials. Business is to take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary on the draft public appointments and public bodies, etc., Scotland Act 2003, the treatment of revenue Scotland as specified authority, <coughs> Order 2014. Mr. Swinney is joined for the item by Colin Miller and Greg Walker of the Scottish Government, both of whom are familiar to members of the committee. Before we come to the motion, seeking our approval at Agenda Item 4, we will have an evidence session on the order. I therefore like to invite the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening statement explaining the instrument and remind him not to move the motion at this point. Kavira, the purpose of this order is to facilitate the appointment of the Chair and Members of Revenue Scotland in good time for the new body to take up its full powers before the devolved taxes come into being on the 1st of April 2015. It does so by providing that these appointments can be regulated by the Commissioner for Ethical Standards in Public Life. 
The legal mechanism for achieving this is an order under Section 3.3 of the Public Appointments and Public Bodies etc. Scotland Act 2003, which is what I have laid before Parliament. The effect of this order, if approved, would be to allow Revenue Scotland to be treated for the purposes of any public appointment as if it was already a specified authority for the purposes of the 2003 Act. This in turn means that the appointments in question would fall within the jurisdiction of the Commissioner for Ethical Standards in Public Life. In this case, the relevant appointments would be the Chair and Members of Revenue Scotland. Convener, this is a well-established and, um, I hope, entirely uncontroversial way of facilitating the making and regulation of appointments to a new public body. And I would leave my com comments at that stage. OK, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. I've got no questions. Uh, any members of the committee have any questions? Uh, committee members also have no questions. Uh, um, we therefore move to item four on our agenda, um, which is to move to the debate on the motion. I invite the Cabinet Secretary formally to move motion S4M-10325. Uh, I now, move the motion to convey my name. I now put the question on the motion. The question is that motion S4M-10325 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Members have uh, indicated their agreement. Uh, the Committee will now publish a short report to the Parliament setting out a decision on the order. I would like to thank the Cabinet Secretary uh, and suspend the meeting to allow change of our witnesses. We will reconvene it fa after five or six minutes to allow members to have an actual break.
we all ready? Right. Okay. <coughs> Reopen the session. Uh, our next item of business today is to continue our consideration of Scotland's public finances post-2014. Our evidence today will focus on pensions, uh, although not exclusively, if colleagues want to bring in other issues. And I welcome to the meeting uh, Professor David Bell, University of Stirling. Of course, it's no stranger to this committee. Uh, Anne Flynn, Pensions Consultant, and Chris Curry, Pensions Policy Institute. Members have uh, copies of written submissions from each of the witnesses, so we'll go straight to questions. Um, now, basically, um, for those who are not familiar with the committee, uh, I'll, answer, I'll ask some opening questions, and then colleagues around the table will be able to ask questions also. Now, I might ask a question directly to one individual, but uh, other uh, members on the panel feel free to comment on those points, but you don't have to if you, if you feel uh, you do not wish to. So, who will we kick off with? Well, I'm, 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 let's just kick off with you, Professor Bell, since you're a kind of battle-scarred veteran <laughs> of this uh, committee. So let's look uh, at paragraph 12 of your uh, submission, and you say, and I quote, that this, uh, the Scottish Government opposed the increase in contribution rates, uh, but was threatened with a loss of grant if it failed to implement them. I wonder if you can expand on that a wee bit and the impact uh, on the Scottish Government of currently being unable to make changes for Scottish circumstances. So, <coughs> um, <coughs> this was um, the outcome <coughs> sorry, of the um, realisation that a lot of public sector pension schemes uh, in, in the UK were in considerable deficit. Uh, and that one way of um, a, r correcting that deficit would be to increase contributions from um, employers and employees. And I think it's particularly the increased um, contributions from employees uh, that you're referring to. <coughs> and effectively... Uh, the Treasury insisted that the Scottish Government apply the same kinds of <clears throat> adjustment to uh, employee contributions as, uh, as were happening in the rest of the UK. Um, so, in a sense, this was the UK Government insisting that uh, the uh, uh, Scottish Government follow its, its preferred method of writing the... Uh, or partially writing the deficits which the uh, public sector schemes uh, were, were currently in. Clearly that does uh, limit the course of action of the Scottish Government. Um, uh, I haven't got uh, at my fingertips the sums that were involved. Uh, going forward, uh, and just taking this whole idea forward a bit, um, public sector pensions are going to be, uh, well, I think Scotland has liabilities at the minute of around 85 billion in public sector um, pension schemes. As you, if, if you're shrinking the public sector, what that means is that for pay as you go schemes, those people who are currently employed are paying for those who are retired and if the number who are currently employed is declining then it becomes more and more difficult in other words the size of the contribution has to increase and increase and increase um, uh, in order to meet the the uh, pension uh, payments that that are, are, are guaranteed this is not a specifically Scottish point but it's, it's a consequence of where, we've, where the UK and Scotland have got to uh, in relation to having at one period of time a quite large public sector and moving to a situation where the public sector is somewhat smaller in a sense, a smaller number of current public sector employees are, are contributing towards a relatively larger number of uh, uh, public sector retirees. I think the sum from memory was about £108 million pounds a, a year. I just wonder if any other uh, panel members have any comments they want to make on that at all. 
Oh, OK, fine. I'll move to uh, another point, actually, but this one is from uh, Anne Flynn's paper. You say in your paper, and I quote, I believe that there will need to be changes for pensions in independent Scotland, the opportunities for Scotland to build on the current framework to develop a socially inclusive and progressive approach to pensions provision. In fact, independence will facilitate the fixing of some of the issues in the current system. And you go on to say uh, it opens up the opportunity to fix some of the problems you live with today. So I'm just wondering if you can expand on that. My key focus is on workplace pensions, and I, my, I lived and breathed the auto enrolment um, legislation for the past 10 years since it was first mooted as, as a working for large providers and helping to influence policy, etc. And in the past year, what I've done is worked actually at the coalface with some significant UK employers seeing that auto enrolment process being put in place. Um, with my, in my own independent consultancy basis. So what I've picked up in that year, working so closely with employers and providers, is the complexity of things like the auto-enrolment um, regulations and what it's doing to mid-sized to large employers already and will do to micro-employers, especially in, I, I would see in Scotland, where that's where a lot of the... Um, you know, the commercial interests lie at the moment, where, where smaller employers of 20 and less will be faced with quite complex rules to deal with and distract them from their business purposes. So I just, I do honestly feel that there's an opportunity, whether it's an independent Scotland or remaining part of the UK, there's reform needed on the auto enrolment regulations as they stand. They have been overcomplicated. Not, I mean, for the right reasons, I believe, in the first place, having watched the regulations develop, as I say, over the past decade. But I think we now have real learning on our hands that we need to apply, um, as I say, whether it's within the UK, the Westminster government, or in, a, in a, an independent Scotland. I also feel that we have already got more UK-wide pension reform being mooted in the terms of collective um, defined contribution pensions, uh, and that will have a, a significant impact um, across the UK, again, whether Scotland is still part of the UK at that point or not. And that needs to be considered because it is, it's an interesting concept that is already um, starting to be or lose favour in in the continent where it has been followed for a number of years because of its lack of fairness to, to members. And I think Professor David Bell's point about the, the working population shrinking in the UK and Scotland and the retired population growing and how you fund that population in terms of whether it's private pension provision, public pension provision or through the state is, um, is the big challenge for any, any country in the, in, you know, in, in the Western world at the moment and I think that that's where we need to start looking at and saying well, how do we do this differently. Okay so how would we do these things differently assuming that the Westminster and Scotland have different views on how we take this matter forward? Um, I, th I think there are a lot of challenges around that if Westminster decide to go down the, the collective defined contribution path and Scotland say decide not to do that but I, I do believe that I think the first thing we could start with is the um, reviewing the auto enrolment legislation and simplifying it from, from a Scottish perspective. The, uh, some of the rules and regulations and rec record keeping are so onerous, I can't see how small businesses are going to manage it in the future. And if we have an equivalent to the, the pensions regulator who will start to police uh, firms on this basis and potentially fine them, um, I think a lot of firms will not comply. I think the larger firms have had the infrastructure to be able to do it. So that, that would be the first thing I would certainly recommend as a, as a review of some of those the record keeping rules and the regulations in terms of who you have to auto enrol or treat differently. There are something like 38 different classifications that your workers could fall into. Um, so uh, you know, from, from a, that perspective, it's just too complex. It needs to be simplified um, and made easier for employers and for employees. It's been very successful. Some of the, the companies I have worked with have had good take-up rates, very few um, people opting out, people more than happy to start paying pension contributions if you get the engagement right. So, you know, it, it can, it is working on a level, but it does need, we do need to help employers manage the whole issue. Okay, so if Scotland did vote yes and it, it did take control of pensions, uh, how would Scotland gain through the changes that you are suggesting? I think Scotland could quite quickly develop a framework that, as I say, is simplified for employers and make it easier for them to engage in that, this pensions regulation. There could be opportunities to incentivise employers. Um, I know that Ros Altman published a paper this week about things she'd recommended in the, the workplace, and I actually think they're, they're, I'm, I'm an advocate of some of the things she said. You could increase the tax release for employers on providing pension education or savings education in the workplace from £150 a year per employee. 
um, upwards. Um, there are yeah, say different levels of incentivisation that Scotland could introduce for employers to better engage in this whole process and help Scottish citizens prepare for their retirement. And how would that help um, not just the employers but the, the workers? Well, I think one of the big things in my experience and all the research I've done with different organisations is that people at the receiving end of pensions, the people in, in the workplace, on the factory floor or in, on the shop floor, really don't understand it. It's, it's been shrouded in some kind of um, language that nobody really could break through. Um, so if you break that down into much simpler language and really help people understand what it means for them, it, it, it makes a huge difference. And that's the kinds of things I've seen happening in the past two years, where the, the actual level of engagement from the employer to the individual employees has been much better and much greater and thinking about the employee rather than and what they, they want and aspire for, rather than you have to contribute to pension and it's coming out of your pay packet, which is the, very much... Before, the, the stance was always very prescriptive based on what the, the legislation said. And now I'm, I'm starting to see a shift towards that more engaging approach and encouraging people to take res pe personal responsibility for their futures. OK. Um, Chris Curry, do you wish to comment on that? Or? Uh, just a, a general observation, uh, I think, really there, as I think the discussion that, we, that, that, that Anne's just been leading about, both collective defined contribution and automatic enrolment, just highlights the fact that pensions policy never really stands still. Uh, and I think it's really important to think about that uh, in, in the context of, of both the UK or an independent Scotland or even internationally. Uh, so as, as an example, in auto automatic enrolment, we know there's already a, a review of the policy planned uh, in the UK in 2017 to see how things are happening, things are working. Uh, Opposition parties are already putting forward proposals to simplify the existing UK system. So I think the, the uh, Labour Party have suggested they would automatically enrol a much larger group of people by reducing the initial threshold uh, of earnings that people need to come into as, as uh, uh, need to earn in order to be automatically enrolled. Uh, on the collective defined contribution side, uh, I think Anne, Anne made a very pertinent point that in Holland, where they've had collective defined contribution schemes for quite a while. They seem to be moving away from that uh, as a model of, uh, of collective provision at the same time as the UK is considering introducing it. But I would also say there's a very wide range of collective defined contribution type schemes. So, for example, there are also schemes in New Brunswick in Canada which work in a, very, in a, in a slightly different way from the way that the Dutch schemes work. So, although you can borrow from international examples, it can be very helpful to build a very kind of specific type of uh, the collective DC scheme or any other scheme which best <coughs> meets the features that you're looking for. So, Bill? Uh, just a couple of general points. One, one is that uh, auto-enrolment is one of the great success stories for behavioural economics, uh, which we uh, study uh, particularly at Stirling University. Um, and in general, you know, one would hope that it will, in the future, uh, given the, given the uh, uh, high level of take-up, reduce issues of pension and poverty uh, in, in the future. The other thing, just picking up what Anne said, financial literacy is, is an important topic and, and not given sufficient attention, I think, in our education system. So that is why a um, large number of employees find it difficult to understand even without the complexity of the regulations as they currently stand, exactly what, what they might be getting out for what they put in in relation to pension contributions. OK, thank you. Now, I want to turn to Chris Curry's uh, paper. Actually, in paragraph 30, you say, and I quote, the principle informing future changes to the, uh, to the um, SPA is that on average, an individual should spend up to a third of their adult life in retirement. For this purpose, adult life is defined as starting at age 20. So in terms of um, the state pensionable age, uh, in the graph that you have following chart one, you said that at the age of 67, if, um, if we have a situation whereby, um, you know, uh, the year in which SPA would increase if the principle set out in the Pension Act 2014 be applied, um, that would be 2019 for England but 2033 for Scotland. So I'm just wondering if you can um, talk us through that a wee bit. Yes, uh, uh, gladly. Uh, the, uh, the, the principle that, I was, that we outlined in the paper there is the, the principle uh, that's now in the 2014 Pensions Act, uh, which sets out the framework of which future state pension ages in the UK uh, might increase. Uh, the, the, as, as you uh, read out from the paper there, uh, the principle is that people should spend uh, 
I think, up to a third of their adult life in retirement and no more th than a third, which means that if you look at, you can use life expectancy projections to try and calculate when, uh, given the definitions in the Act, people will, uh, on average, uh, in, uh, in the UK start to, to, to meet that one third level. And those are the, the figures that we put in the table there. I think what this also highlights, though, is that there are various uh, differences in life expectancy across a number of different dimensions. The ones that we've highlighted in the paper here are obviously uh, regional dimensions. And uh, I think in, in most of the papers that I've seen which talk about the issue of state pensions in Scotland, the, the, the demographic situation in Scotland with uh, uh, increasingly uh, a, a large proportion of the population at older ages, but those people at older ages with shorter life expectancies than in the rest of the population means that, as you can see from the chart that we've got in the, in the evidence, uh, people in Scotland taken as a, as a Scottish population as a whole and not uh, as part of the UK would reach that one-third tipping point much later than you would do in the, in the rest of the UK. Uh, and that happens uh, on, a, on a consistent basis, not just kind of by the time you reach age 67, but by the time uh, state pension age will go up to 68 and 69, it's roughly 11 to 12 years behind the rest of the UK throughout the period that we've looked at there. Uh, now, that isn't necessarily the only thing that will or ought to be taken into account in considering state pension age uh, and in the Pensions Act. There are other uh, criteria which will be used, such as uh, labour market impacts, impacts on... Uh, or the impacts of healthy life expectancy. Uh, and I think it's not going to be a, a very precise, this is what the formula says, this is what's going to be implemented. There will be a review uh, at, at regular periods, which will try and take, and take into account other factors as well. Uh, but I think what the chart highlights is, is if that particular policy was used in an independent Scotland and it had the same basis, then actually you would, uh, on that basis, see the, the, the tipping point for state pension age increasing being much later in Scotland than in the rest of the UK. Okay, so, so basically what you're saying is if it was an independent Scotland, they should, they should wait 12 years later than England in terms of implementing it, all else being equal? Uh, I, I, w I would say that that's what the, 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 that part of, the, of the, the equation would suggest, but I think there are other factors that would need to be taken into account in actually determining exactly when state pension age should increase, uh, as there is uh, kind of the, the, the other external factors around uh, the Pensions Act. Uh, I think one of the issues as well as part of that would be uh, affordability uh, and how much it would cost uh, to uh, pay pensions earlier uh, in, in, uh, in Scotland compared to the rest of the UK. Uh, but even just considering within, within Scotland there are other impacts, there's an increase in benefit expenditure. I think as, as Professor Bell has highlighted in work that he's done, there's uh, changes in income tax receipts as a result of people having different spending patterns. Uh, and also the UK government estimated there's quite a big difference in economic growth because of the labour market impacts of people being able to take a pension earlier and therefore being less likely to continue in the workplace. So I think you'd need to consider all of those different factors before actually deciding exactly what the state pension age increase should be and when. I'm tempted just to ask you, but what do you think it should be? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I was qualified to answer that question. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I think what, what, what's really important is to consider why... Uh, state pension age is increasing and what you would like to achieve with an increased state pension age and then really it's a balancing act uh, as part of that. Uh, the underlying demographics in Scotland, in the UK, in the world as a whole uh, suggest that state pension ages will need to increase uh, over time. Uh, the question then really is, is how quickly should they increase and I think that really is a, a subjective decision in, in the same way as a lot of pensions decisions are subjective there's always trade-offs involved between uh, how much you pay to people, how how early you pay them, and then how much it costs, and, and what the, 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 the contribution from the working age population is in order to fund that. And I think uh, for Scotland, you'd need to look at those two, those aspects separately in order to come to, to, to a conclusion. Okay, thank you. That was a very political answer. I was, <laughs> I was very impressed by that. Now, uh, Professor Bell, you're desperate to come in. I know yeah, you've just been jumping about there like a hen in a hot garden for the last two minutes. Uh, so I'm going to come to you on that particular issue. I mean, you do, do go on uh, in the paragraph 16 to touch on that. You say that on average state pension costs are around 6 to 8% less per pension in Scotland due to lower life expectancy. But to be fair, you also go on to, to say that payments for incapacity benefit, severe disability allowance and disability love allowance are well above Scotland's population share. And indeed, you have a helpful graph on the other side, which 
uh, looks at Scotland's share of state benefits in Great Britain 2012-13 across a whole host. So, for example, incapacity benefit is higher, but discretionary housing payments, housing benefit, council tax benefit, for example, is lower. Um, but overall, do you accept that uh, <coughs> social protection is, uh, you know, in 2000? 12-13 uh, was, was less a proportion of GDP in Scotland than it was in the UK um, as a whole. So if you take a geographic share of North Sea oil um, as your metric for the, uh, the uh, denominator, then uh, uh, I think the difference uh, between <coughs> spending per head on DWP benefits in Scotland uh, and that in the rest of the UK, which has been narrowing quite significantly over the last 15 years or so. So 15 years ago, the, the spending per head in Scotland was, was quite markedly higher. But the, the difference has been narrowing. And so if you take that as the denominator, the uh, geographic share of North Sea Oil, I think it is correct that... Um, welfare benefits would be uh, a lower proportion of, uh, of GDP. Uh, don't ask me what the exact difference is, but I think, that, I think that's correct. OK, uh, th thanks for that. Um, and, and you, you talk in paragraph 16, you talk about the discussion of the relative cost of the state pension, and you, talk, you, you say that tend, a lot of this is tend to focus on the accuracy of the migration assumptions underpin these population projections. You know, the IFS, for example, have talked about a 4.4% increase in Scottish population through migration to, over the next 50 years, but is it not the case in the last 10 years there's been a 4.4% increase in Scotland's population through inward migration? Uh, yeah, so, I mean, I, 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 interest, uh, I listened with interest to the um, discussion of the Cabinet Secretary uh, uh, as I was sat uh, behind him earlier on about forecasting, and um, I uh, spent some time in, a, in an institute that was uh, spent its time assessing different bodies' um, forecasts of the uh, economic future and, and in the course of that became extremely sceptical about uh, the uh, especially long-term forecasts in relation to the economy. So um, migration is particularly difficult to forecast. It is the case that uh, Scotland has had a very significant net inward migration in the last decade. That uh, was preceded by decades of low to high levels of net emigration rather than immigration. So the, the net immigration of the last decade was driven primarily by the A8 migrants who came, who came to Scotland and a much closer balance between um, uh, migration from the rest of the UK into Scotland and uh, with migration out of Scotland into the rest of the UK. So yes, it is true that the last decade has been uh, particularly uh, favourable in, res in respect of increased immigration to Scotland. I would hesitate, uh, for, uh, partly for the reasons I gave earlier, to, to project that into the future, also because of... Um, it's effectively nothing on the horizon, it seems to me, that would uh, in this have the same effect on immigration as the A8 uh, immigration did uh, in the noughties. Um, and, of course, within the UK, considerable uncertainty as to where immigration policy is going to go over the next decade anyway. Except that over the, the, you know the the kind of uh, the zeitgeist, I suppose, in the UK is uh, is to reduce immigration, but clearly Scotland, if it had powers of independence, might take a, a different viewpoint. Would that not perhaps have a, a different impact in Scotland relative to the rest of the UK? Uh, so there there are complications. Yeah, there there are complications here. Um, clearly, Scotland could set out a more liberal immigration policy, no question about that, if it was independent. Could it have a more liberal immigration policy within the existing UK? It is possible. 
We've had future talent in the past. Quebec runs a somewhat different immigration policy to um, the rest of Canada. Um, another complication is presumably that we would want to be part of a common travel area with the rest of the UK in the way that Ireland is part of a common travel area with the UK at the minute. And um, we would have to take cognizance, I think, then of the um, uh, whether uh, uh, the uh, immigration policy that the uh, rest of the UK was following uh, was in some way being compromised if people migrated into Scotland and then moved on to England and Wales. That could happen within a common travel area. That might be feasible within a common travel area. So there's a question about whether there would be negotiation uh, uh, around uh, Scotland's independence to set its own immigration policy if it also wanted to be part of the common travel area. And Flynn, have you got any comments you want to make on these kind of points that have been uh, raised recently? Slightly at a tangent, but just on, on that basis that there, there is a, um, immigration to Scotland has increased, um, which has obviously strengthened the Scottish economy and allowed it to grow, is the, um, the impact that has on pensions too. This is another issue that's starting to, to emerge quite strongly for a lot of employers. They have migrant workers who may stay here, the rest of their lives may move on, and they'll have a UK pen, a pension pot that, you know, what do they do with um, beyond, the, with they leave the, the UK shores and head off somewhere else. So there's actually a need for almost um, pan-European pension reform to help all of this, because um, it's becoming more and more complex for people as they m become m much more mobile. And again, an independent Scotland, that's something they could look at and, and consider in terms of how they treat those people. OK, uh, thank you for that. Now, we've developed a wee bit of a self-denying ordinance on the committee because um, we've had sessions um, such as this that have lasted more than three hours. And I don't want you to put that through that, so I shall not ask any further questions at this point, but I shall open up the session to colleagues around the table. And the first one uh, to ask questions will be Jamie. Thank you. Uh, can we want to return to uh, the, uh, your paper, uh, Mr Curry, and uh, the exchange you just had with uh, the convener about uh, the impact of state pension age uh, increasing and the fact that Scottish pensioners on average aren't going to benefit as much. And I thought you made an interesting point that consistently uh, we're, we're 11 or 12 years behind in catching up with the uh, average. Uh, I thought that was the essence of, of what you said, but note on, on chart one, to make the point further, essentially under the uh, the formula it posited, essentially each time Scotland catches up, the UK as a whole is virtually ready to move on to the next uh, step and, and increase the state pension age further. So this problem is we're, we're, we're always going to be 11 or 12 years behind if we stay in the UK context under current uh, policy. Is that not the case? I mean, I think, think that's right if the current projections of life expectancy within Scotland and the rest of the UK are correct. I think I'd, I'd echo what, what Professor Bell was saying earlier about long-term projections, not just in migration, but on life expectancy as well. Uh, and there's not a great track record of being accurate with life expectancy projections uh, in the UK or anywhere else in the world for that matter. Uh, but you're right, on the, on, if, if we take the current projections as being uh, the best estimate we have of where things are likely to go, then, then yes, this is a, a, a continual problem uh, that's happening as part of that. But part of it, I think, uh, that, that, that there's a number of different things that, that it's probably worth bringing out. One is that the average in particular areas and, and on regions such as Scotland, the rest of the UK, England, they're quite big areas and actually there's quite a lot of variation even within those areas. Uh, and I think there's other evidence that we put, put in the paper that suggests actually kind of where there's lowest life expectancy in Scotland, uh, I th th think uh, in Glasgow City for for life expectancy at age 65 is just under 15 years. Actually, in Manchester, life expectancy is, is just under 16 years, so there's not a massive difference there. Whereas in the Orkney Islands, which is the best performing uh, place in Scotland, if you, if, you, if you think of it in performance terms, is just under 20 years. Uh, in Harrow, in England, it's just over uh, 20 years. So th 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 there's wide variation within regions as well as there being differences uh, across regions. That's not to say the differences across regions aren't important. They, they, they obviously are. Uh, but I also think that there is a particular 
uh, issue around whether we look at state pension age as trying to treat the symptoms or trying to treat the cause. And I think actually there's a real underlying issue uh, in there being variations across region in, in any case. And I think actually there's a, a to, to my mind, a potentially bigger policy issue, which is what can be done to try and reduce the inequality in life expectancies across these different places. Now, that could be down to health, it could be down to lifestyle and behaviour. Uh, in particular, over, over recent years, uh, smoking has been highlighted as a very important cause of differences in life expectancy. Uh, so there, there's also treatments uh, through, through health and those kind of things. So I think, uh, although there are implications uh, of having a fixed state pension age at any point uh, for regions where life expectancy is lower, uh, and changes in life expectancy therefore have a bigger proportionate impact on those areas with lower life expectancy. Uh, I think it's an important feature of any policy discussion going forward would be to try and think about how you could narrow those inequalities so therefore the, the state pension age changes would be closer together if you use the same basis and actually would have less impact on certain parts of the, uh, of, of the UK or Scotland. Um, I mean, I absolutely accept the point you, you make in terms of uh, regional variation, but Obviously, we're looking at Scotland's finances post-2014, so you'll understand what we're looking at Scotland's whole. And I would also accept absolutely the point, I suppose, uh, fundamentally, we hope that we can uh, improve health and, and people will uh, live longer here in Scotland. But just to, to, to emphasise uh, the point under uh, Chart 1 in your uh, paper, the new state pension age would uh, rise to 67 in, uh, across the UK in 2021. Scotland would only uh, reach that... Uh, uh, average uh, level in 2033, and it would be 2033, the UK would be seeking to increase it to 68. We wouldn't reach, reach 68 until 2045. And then just the next year, in 2046, the UK would be looking to increase it to 69. So at least on the trends that are identified, you could argue that Scotch pensioners are, are getting a bit of a rough deal. Show that, 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 that uh, I think, as you, as you very clearly stated, that if life expectancy stays the same as the projections, then Scotland... Uh, would always be uh, kind of having a lower life expectancy and therefore having a lower expectation of time receiving the state pension than the other parts of the UK if the UK raised it purely along, along the lines as set out in the table. Uh, I think, as I, as I mentioned to the, in the discussion with the convener earlier, there are other factors rather than just the formula which would be used to actually set state pension age in, in the UK and, and perhaps regional variations might be one of the factors which is taken into account, but that will depend on who is appointed by the government to, to, to undertake the review at the time uh, and also what, what, what the government, uh, how the government considers the outcome of that review. Hey. Could, could I just add, um, um, yes, we've, we've certainly it also came to the conclusion that on average the state pension costs per person are cheaper in Scotland for the reasons about uh, um, life expectancy that Chris has just been discussing. Chris also, in an earlier answer, answer mentioned a, a very important issue, and that's healthy life expectancy, which is... Uh, how long people can expect to live in good health um, rather than how long they can expect to live. And where Scotland also uh, is somewhat behind the rest of the UK is that the gap between healthy life expectancy and life expectancy is bigger in Scotland than it is in the rest of the UK. And that's primarily uh, reflected in Figure three in my paper, which shows, you know, on average, more is being spent on incapacity benefit, on severe disablement allowance, and so on and so on. And surely what we really want for Scotland is to increase life expectancy, but particularly to increase healthy life expectancy, so that more of the third of the life that people may be retired in is spent in good health. Um, and that could have a beneficial effect on Scotland's finances because it would reduce the relative spending on these um, uh, benefits that are associated with disability and ill health. Well, I think we all Professor Bill and indeed uh, the Pension Policy Institute, uh, paragraph 37, make the, the point there that uh, on average uh, individuals in Scotland and indeed Wales and Northern Ireland, who retire at state pension age, uh, spend a greater proportion of their talent in ill health than individuals in England, so they, they make that point as well. Can I t turn to the issue of uh, population 
uh, trends as well, because uh, Professor Bell, you talk about this in uh, your uh, paper, and you've touched on it with uh, the, the convener as well. And, uh, in your paper, you uh, do say that any uh, predictions uh, about population trends, you make the point, of course, that this is a, a key uh, part of the, the debate about state pensions and uh, the, the ratios involved, but you do make the point in your paper that any uh, predictions must be uh, subject to uh, large uh, margins of error. And in, indeed, in the, uh, your paper, Mr uh, Curry, you uh, operate on the, uh, through most of the paper, you operate on the assumption of the uh, ONS uh, low migration uh, scenario. I don't necessarily criticise you for that, because I know that the OBR and the UK government have uh, chosen to do so as well. But I, I do understand that estimate is way below uh, actual migration trends uh, in uh, recent years. But I thought your paper was quite interesting uh, uh, at uh, paragraph 84, where you do say that if you take the mid-migration uh, scenario, you see uh, expenditure uh, for working age uh, people uh, by the mid-2050s is more or less the same as the UK, but under the high migration scenario, uh, pensions become uh, more affordable uh, in Scotland. And of course, we're in the uh, position where, I don't know, maybe you wouldn't accept, but I, I would imagine most people would accept that the Scottish Government's ability to influence these matters is uh, somewhat limited uh, at this moment in time. Would you accept that? I mean, I think, I, I think it's really important that whenever we do any of these estimates, we try and highlight the sensitivities that are involved in doing them. And I think uh, that we identified and other people have identified uh, that the migration assumption is quite an important one uh, in, in trying to think about what the population and demographics might look like in future in particular for Scotland. Uh, it's not the only key factor. I mean, so Scotland also has a kind of lower fertility rate than other parts of the UK, which, which has an impact on the starting population that you have now, where you have fewer uh, individuals in Scotland or a, few, a, a smaller proportion of the population in Scotland aged under 44 and a greater proportion aged over 44 still has an impact for a large number of years going through. The particular uh, paragraph on the chart that, that we showed to you there is, is uh, along the lines of the, the Department of Work and Pensions in the UK We've looked at uh, uh, spending on pensioner benefits per working age person in Scotland as a way to try and look at the affordability, so trying to, to recognise the fact that pensioner benefits will be funded by the working age population. Uh, I think a better measure, if we had it, would be to look at the working population rather than the working age, uh, because there are all sorts of interactions, as, as Professor Bell has mentioned, about levels of disability different employment rates over time, but also people working beyond state pension age who could also make contributions to the economy uh, as part of that. But we have to, to work with what we have. Uh, and, and so we did decide to look at that, looking at, at, at how that would vary under different migration assumptions. Now, uh, we, we, we are not in a position to be able to, to project which of these particular sets is, is the most likely outcome. And as you say, we've used as, as, our, as our main projection throughout the, the, the analysis we've shown here, the low migration assumption, which is that used by the Office, Office for Budget Responsibility in the UK, which is the rationale that we've used for doing that. But if you do use alternative projections, and I think uh, the, the mid uh, scenario uh, put forward by the, the Office of National Statistics, which I think has an increase in the working age population of 3% by 2030 compared to the low scenario and 10% by 2050, you do get by the end of the projection period much closer to levels of, of aggregate spending uh, and spending per, uh, per individual in the working age population in Scotland as you do in the UK. And if you go further and use the high migration assumption, which is a 6% increase in the working age population above the low uh, scenario uh, by 2030 and a 20% higher working age, so it's a very significant increase in the population, uh, the working age population, by, the, uh, by 2050, you do start to see even then expenditure uh, per working age individual being lower in Scotland than it is in the rest of the UK because of that particular growth uh, in the working age population. And that's from about 2040 onwards. But that does imply quite rapid growth in the working age population, uh, which isn't apparent from the f fertility figures that so would have to come through migration. Uh, and I think as has been discussed, there's a wider range of issues around immigration and, and the ability uh, for both uh, the, 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 any government to influence migration, uh, but also the impact of migration on other, other parts of the economy. I, mean, that, I suppose I mean, that's very helpful. That's the bit I'm probably more interested in, though, because I, I, mean, I absolutely accept the point. You know, projections are uh, very difficult, and I think that was a fundamental 
that was the top line of your, your answer, and I, I take that on board. I suppose the, and you know, I'm aware of not direct a question at uh, Anne Flynn yet, but you know, her paper was talking about the opportunities with independence. I mean, would one of the opportunities of independence to be, and maybe she'll have a perspective on this, uh, be that we can perhaps greater influence migration trends and, and policy? I mean, certainly, I thought it was interesting Professor Bell was talking about the potential for there being a degree of difference uh, in terms of migration policy within the confines of the UK, but that's entirely beholden on the, uh, the uh, how willing the UK government is to be in that uh, uh, regard. It's not in the hands of the Scottish government. With independence, the context would be different. To at least attempt to achieve, to try and achieve, I suppose, is the point I make. Would you all accept that? As I said, in the, as part of the, the long answer I gave to the, to the previous part of the question, uh, I, I, at, at the Pensions Policy Institute, we, we, we focused on the pensions issues and not on the, on the migration issues. So I don't feel, uh, again, suitably qualified to be able to say whether that's something that, that Scotland, uh, independent Scotland, would be able to achieve or should be, be looking to achieve, because I think there are, there are much wider implications. But uh, if you could achieve it, then, then it would have potentially positive implications for the affordability of pension expenditure. Thank you. Uh, Professor, you, you seem to indicate uh, well, well, I, the I, hypothesis. I mean, yeah, I mean, in particular, um, since um, overseas students uh, are more important to Scotland than they are to the UK as a whole, I think, you know, it would certainly be in the interest of um, Scottish universities and indeed the Scottish economy because a certain proportion will always... Um, find uh, Scotland so attractive that they want to stay if, uh, if it were easier to uh, attract students uh, to Scottish institutions. And, and over the last couple of years, we have, we have suffered somewhat uh, uh, as a result of uh, current policies. I don't know if you have anything to add to the Yeah, I do. I, I, think, um, I, think, I think your point, you're quite right. That in an independent Scotland, we should be looking to shape the migration policy that we need to, you know, make it make an impact on the economy. But particularly, I mean, I, I just believe that the more the more we can increase the working population, the more we see revenues increase, etc., and um, costs can, can be um, reduced on benefits. And, and it also, with the, the impact of auto enrolment and people saving for pension on a private basis, the reliance on state pension changes a little bit in terms of. Uh, you know, they may, and, and incentivising people maybe to delay their state pension as well, which is an option for healthy people that may be still working. Um, there, there are various aspects that be, could be looked at there. And w w one last area, if I, if I may, it can be, again, it's in your paper, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Curry. Uh, I, mean, I thought it was a very helpful uh, paper that you've uh, provided. Uh, at paragraph uh, 18, uh, you say that uh, under the Scottish Government's uh, proposal, low earning women with career breaks age 44 in 2014 and reaching a uh, state pension age at 67 in 2037, who is automatically enrolled in a workplace pension at minimum contribution level when she is in work, could have an income from state and private pensions £14 a week higher under the Scottish Government proposals than in the current UK system, which I make out to be £728 per annum. We should say, of course, that's in 2014. Uh, eight, eight earnings uh, terms, and also at paragraph 20, you see under the, uh, the Scottish Government uh, proposals that the medium earning man could be entitled to same credit less than five years after reaching state pension age. Uh, this would increase his state and private pension further under the Scottish Government proposals compared to the uh, U current UK system. I just wonder what you've factored in there. Is it both the, uh, the uh, single tier uh, pension starting at £106? I think I noticed in your paper you've Start at £159 for 2014 yeah. prices, and does it also include the, the triple lock operating element it, it, as well? It does. Uh, what, that, what that includes is, as you say, that the £160 uh, starting point for the uh, single tier pension, it, it is £160 in 2016. What we've done in the paper is converted all the figures back to today's earnings terms, which is why it looks slightly lower, although it is actually 20... If you roll that forward to 2016, it would be £160, uh, which we've assumed is just over a pound a week higher than would be used in the UK, although that is obviously subject to what's determined by the UK government in the run-up to, to April 2016. There's nothing on the face of the Pensions Act which sets exactly what the level will be. We've assumed that it will be triple-locked under both 
of those particular scenarios on the basis that there is a commitment uh, from the Scottish Government to do that for at least the first five years. Uh, and although there's no commitment from the UK Government as of yet, people, uh, some of the political parties are starting to get there and the impact assessment used in the Pensions Act also used that as an assumption, so that's why we've, we've used that there. What we've also included, and this is, this is probably one of the potential differences within that is the, the retention of savings credit beyond 2016 for individuals reaching state pension age after 2016, which is another uh, Scottish Government proposal which was uh, put, put forward last year. Uh, the, the issue of savings credit is a very interesting one, uh, and I think there are two impacts as part of that. I think as we've highlighted here, and we felt it was important to highlight, uh, savings credit being in place does mean that people reaching state pension age would have higher pensioner benefits. Uh, and that's driving some of the figures we've seen elsewhere in terms of pensioner benefit per individual of working age. Part of that is because people reaching state pension age in Scotland would be retiring under a more generous system and would so have higher incomes in retirement, all other things being equal. Uh, and that is particularly important, as we, as we saw, for lower earners, uh, where uh, the savings credit entitlement, if they only have, access, uh, only have entitlement to a single tier pension and very small amounts of other pension, then savings credit can be a very important kind of top up to their income uh, above and beyond the single tier pension level if that's retained in the future. The individuals we're looking at here will be reaching state pension age in the mid-2030s, I think 2037 or so. Uh, but interestingly, I think the median earning man illustrates the other side of, of savings credit, which is that yes, after a period of around five years or so, they would become entitled to savings credit and that would provide a further boost in their income. So I think uh, under just the single tier proposals, put forward by the Scottish Government, there's a difference around a pound a week for, for that individual, but it goes up to around two to three pounds a week because of savings credit once savings credit kicks in. And that undoubtedly gives them a boost to their income. The only difficulty with, with savings credit is the impact of means testing on private pension saving. Uh, now, that is something which has been debated very heavily in the UK context over the previous 10 years, especially with the introduction of automatic enrolment, and a concern that... Uh, people uh, historically have, have found any reason not to save, which is why automatic enrolment has been introduced. But one reason, uh, if you look at it in e economic terms, there are probably two different impacts, an income effect and a substitution effect. Uh, so the higher income people get from the state, the less likely they are to save on top of that. But secondly, the lower the additional benefit of saving, the lower, the lower amounts people save as part of doing that. Uh, and this kind of works in both of those uh, areas and it means that if you look at the median earner for example if he didn't save if he opted out of automatic enrollment he wouldn't lose all of the value of his pension saving because he would receive 15 pounds a week of pension credit instead so almost half of what he gains from saving he could actually get from not saving so it reduces the incentive for him to save in doing that now it's very difficult to, to say in aggregate terms what impact that would have on levels of saving and in fact you could argue uh, that given that automatic enrolment levels of opt-out at the moment are very, very low in a UK context, less than 10% across all the, the individuals who have been automatically enrolled since October 2012, it might only have a, a relatively small effect. But the way in which individuals make saving decisions, and especially as other research we've done has highlighted that actually just saving the minimum amount for automatic enrolment is still not enough. People will need to find some, some way of putting more into pension saving. Uh, that could be more difficult in a situation where savings credit exists and therefore reduces the extra value of saving. So there, there's a definite bonus in terms of giving a, a more generous income on retirement or enduring retirement for people who go on to savings credit later in their life, but there's a potential impact on the level of saving that people make. And just quickly clarify, you included some of the Scottish Government commitments yep. also in uprating pensions for the rest of the UK in this comparison, is that what you said there? Uh, so, so in both scenarios we, we, we've, we've assumed the triple lock for single tier pension. is isn't an equivalent commitment, so actually the uh, differential could be even greater where you say it's £14 a week higher than the Scottish Government proposals, it could actually be more. If, if in the UK the, 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 uh, an earnings link, as is the minimum required by legislation was used instead of a triple lock, then yes there will be a bigger difference between the two. And to be followed by Malcolm. Thank you, uh, Kavira. Um, first one, just uh, I suppose on a fairly narrow issue uh, question for uh, Anne Flynn. Um, you say in your paper Scotland doesn't need an equivalent 
to Nest. And obviously the white paper talks about, I think it's called CEST, which... Yes. Um, I don't think they understood that why Nest was branded the way it was, but that's yeah. another issue. Um, yeah, not sure, but, but I mean, you're, so, so your view, let, let's imagine there's a yes vote and, and Scotland becomes independent. Your view is that there sh we shouldn't set up CEST, just to, to call it that. How, what, what would you propose in that scenario? I just think in the, the past two years and watching <coughs> what's happened in the, um, in the, with auto-enrolment and for um, NEST in particular, NEST has been reasonably successful and I think they've gone over a million members now um, just recently. But what we've also seen is other, um, I've seen more of the, the less um, established providers, master trust providers as they're known, um, stepping up to the mark and taking a lot of the population that NEST was sort of originally designed to do. So what, what I believe is that rather than creating a Scottish version of NEST, whatever it would be called, you could actually negotiate a, a, a Scottish auto enrolment scheme design with one of these other providers that would offer um, a savings vehicle for people that aren't auto enrolled into private um, workplace pension schemes where employers just feel that's the only option that they want. So what I'm trying, what, the point I was trying to make was I don't think you have the, net, the infrastructure costs of setting up CEST. You could actually do it, deliver that same solution in a different way. So. Thank you. Um, the other thing in your paper, you talk, about, you talk briefly about the cross-border issue for, for private pensions and obviously with, your, um, uh, with the, the work that you do, you must see some of the, uh, the issues that could come from that. What are the, I mean, how, oner, how onerous do you view these issues and how would you solve them should they arise? Solutions an interesting one, but what, what I've certainly come across um, in the past couple of years, particularly in the defined contribution pension arena, is that you know UK employers who have operations throughout the UK and also in ERA, for example, and how they then have to make provisions. So if the UK employees can all be put into a registered UK pension scheme, but their ERA employees are put into a, a pension scheme registered there, and they're quite distinct bodies. So my concern is that we, we could, um, an independent Scotland could really disturb some UK um, employers with Scottish operations who are used to having one arrangement, they've got all their administration set up and all the rest of it, and suddenly they're faced with actually here's a different set of rules that I need to adhere to and um, contribute to you know, a Scottish registered pension scheme. So my, my simple solution, whether it's possible or not, and I'm sure legal people would tell me whether it is or not, that, that you know, it, to work with um, pension providers and administrators to create some form of creating sections that could accommodate Scottish operations of UK companies. And as I say, I, I don't fully understand the legal implications of that, but it's just to try and minimise the impact on, as I say, UK employers that currently have operations in Scotland, not having to force them to change into a whole different regime. There's also the, the, the issue if the, the basic rate of tax changes in Scotland, and that's the, the, the principle of pension saving at the moment in the UK, is you get basic ra rate relief in your personal contributions, that, that could have a severe impact, impact as well. My own experience of working with providers, I know that they have, a few of them have thought about this and have already parameterised their systems so that if they have a different tax rate in Scotland and one in England, they can still run pension schemes on the same basis, um, but applying the right tax reliefs. Um, so it, it, is, it does become quite complex, but I think it's, it's one that just needs to be carefully thought through the impacts and what the possible solutions could be. And I, I think there are solutions, as I say, whether they, they could be um, validated on a legal basis. The other big issue is um, salary sacrifice, which is a very common f form used by employers to make pension contributions that they uh, agree with their employees to do it on that basis because it saves the employer national insurance contributions, whether that's something people would want going forward, but it also helps the individuals to, to make pension contributions on a more, more efficient basis. Uh, salary sacrifice is currently written in primary legislation in the UK, so how would we then move that into an independent Scotland to make sure it can continue to work here? Uh, Grateful, thank you. Um, right, moving on to uh, Professor Bell. Professor Bell, on your, in your paper, paragraph uh, 17 uh, of your paper, um, just an issue that, that I guess has cropped up in discussion or, or debate occasionally. Um, yeah, paragraph 17, you talk about the age dependency ratio being the ratio between those uh, over the age of 65 compared to those of the age of 16 through to 64. 
the Scottish Government, in much of their work, whether it is their pensions paper or indeed the white paper, uh, they compare the ratio of those of uh, working age against those over 65 and those under the age, I can't remember if it's 16 or 18, but, but those under a certain age. And by, by comparing those ratios instead, the, the, the position as between Scotland and the rest of the, key, the UK looks more similar compared to the graph that you've shown, uh, figure four. Um, can you just explain the difference between those two and why, which, if we're being sort of objective about it, which, which ratio is more commonly used, more useful to work out the viability uh, of pensions and so on? Okay, so um, effectively you're trying to calibrate the extent to which those who are uh, dependent in some measure on state support, um, the number of those relate to the number of those who are providing taxes, uh, contributions that will, uh, that will support these people. So clearly it is true that um, those aged 16 and under, or sorry, under 16, um, receive a significant amount of state support, primarily the education budget. Now, we've already discussed that the fertility rate in the rest of the UK is higher than it is in Scotland. So Scotland has a relatively smaller share of that age group, 0 to 15, than does the rest of the UK. Going um, for those aged 65 and over, uh, Scotland will have a relatively larger proportion. If we're thinking about pensions and support for older people in relation to um, the working age uh, group, then uh, probably the graph that I've shown is more relevant. Having said that, it's a pretty um, rough and ready measure in that uh, it doesn't really take, it, it kind of assumes that people might retire at 65. Well, uh, in the, uh, certainly in the 1990s and the following decades, many, many people retired before 65. What you've, ha what you've seen actually happening since the beginning of the recession is that the number of older workers has increased quite dramatically, whereas the number of young people um, uh, it, getting, getting jobs has, has suffered somewhat. So we've had high levels of youth unemployment, but at the same time, large numbers of older people, many of them self-employed, uh, uh, in the workplace. So, and this, is ha this has happened in the UK as a whole, it's also, it's also happened in Scotland. So if you're trying to get a kind of idea of uh, how the costs of dealing with the older population in relation to the capacity of the economy to generate taxes, then I think this would be the more appropriate measure, but it isn't a perfect measure. Okay. Well, that's helpful. Um, one other thing from, from your paper, uh, paragraph 10, um, you say, to establish efficient bond trading, the Scottish Government would have to set up a bond market. This would be the major priority immediately after independence. Just, I, I, mean, I think you're one of, the, one of the first people, I think, to, to make that point to the committee, um, unless I've missed it. I mean, are you aware of, of work being done on that? Because when I, when I think through the documents I've read and the white paper and so on, I'm not aware of a huge amount of work uh, on that issue. I'm just wondering if, if there is work that you're available, uh, aware of. I, pre I don't know of any at the minute, but I presume that work would have to be done in the period before the uh, final agreement was... It, it would, well, it wouldn't... There's no presumption about it. It would have to happen. Mm. Uh, because um, depending on what arrangement there is for Scotland to take over a share of the debt, whatever that share might be, um, and even if it didn't, uh, there would be a need to borrow um, almost immediately, and that can't happen without there being 
uh, unless you do some deal with uh, with with, a, with a, uh, another sovereign that has a large wealth fund or something, there there would have to be a market in Scottish debt. That that would have to happen straight away. And the last issue for me then, just Chris Curry's paper, paragraph nine. I think it is of that paper you make um, the point in relation to pensions. You're saying it doesn't mean it would be unaffordable. Rather, the Scottish government would need to raise revenue, uh, um, reduce spend in other areas, or have higher government debt levels. I mean, that's an argument, obviously, we've heard before. Um, just to, are, are you aware of any work, or has your uh, institute done any work to try and quantify what sort of sums, looking at the pension uh, commitments or, or possibilities? Are, is, is there work done out there that can try and put some numbers on the, the point that you make at paragraph 9? I mean, it's not something that we've done uh, at, that, at the Pensions Policy Institute. And interestingly, uh, I mean, the, the issues around that paragraph, I think, were actually uh, kind of came out in the previous question that you asked Professor Bell about kind of how you define a dependency ratio, because one of the issues that you have in, in Scotland is, is a smaller proportion of the population who are uh, of school age. Uh, and so potentially that might mean lower levels of, of relative expenditure uh, on there, which may mean you can afford to spend more on the older generation. So that's kind of some of the trade-offs that are involved in determining whether a particular level of spending is affordable uh, or not. It's not something that we've done any particular work on, given that, that we focus purely on the, on the pension side. I don't think we'd be able to look at the, the kind of more uh, economy-wide implications. But in terms of, of the gap, I mean, as, as we show in the paper, uh, there is an increasing diversion in expenditure per head of the working age population on pensioner benefits between UK uh, and Scotland, uh, mainly driven by the old age dependency ratio, but also partly driven by so some of the different policy decisions that, that the Scottish Government have proposed to put forward. Uh, and I think that by the time we get into uh, the kind of 2050s or so, uh, kind of the difference is around £150 per person of working age per year. Uh, of which about two thirds is due purely to ageing. Uh, Gavin, it's uh, Malcolm to fall by Michael. I'm um, just starting with some of what Gavin Brown was asking recently. I mean, in a kind of way, you don't go into this, Professor Bell, in great detail, but of course it relates to other discussions we've had with earlier panels when you talk about pension companies. Uh, buying bonds and obviously that would be the, the interest rate charged would be very relevant to that and then uh, you say um, you know if there was if there was a higher interest rate you know that could be impacted by leaving the currency union it's just a throwaway remark you make but I, I suppose I'm just con I'm just interested in what the effect of different interest rate and currency arrangements could have on the uh, resources of pension companies yeah, I mean, this is a very complicated area. Um, uh, it is not um, clear yet um, uh, how a Scottish bond market would develop. And um, if there was uh, no currency union, then there would have to be, there would, there would clearly be uh, a bond market dealing in some different currency. If there's a, a currency union, then I guess um, uh, you don't have any currency risk, so that would actually, um, well, there's what's called the re-denomination risk. And that is, uh, uh, there is a, there is a um, line in the white paper that um, the uh, Scottish Government kind of reserves the right to uh, go its own way in relation to currency uh, post-independence, but obviously the wish is to continue to form a currency union. If you are buying bonds, then m you might try to price in uh, a premium based on how realistic or unrealistic you think that that, that particular uh, uh, statement might be. Um, then Effectively, well, you, uh, as I say earlier in, in the paper, um, there are a set of uh, pension funds out there already that will uh, be expecting to pay Scottish pension uh, 
members of schemes uh, in the future. And implicitly, given what I say effectively, that pension wealth per person probably isn't much different in Scotland from the rest of uh, the UK, the value of these uh, commitments uh, is very, very substantial. It's worth much more than North Sea, well, worth about the same, sorry, about the same as North Sea oil uh, um, is in the future. So there is the question of how um, these commitments to uh, Scottish uh, pension scheme members in uh, funds that are held um, by both Scottish and UK companies uh, at present uh, would be paid out to those pension um, members in the case of there not being a currency union. That just uh, uh, would seem to me to be an extremely difficult problem. It, you know, uh, it might be that people would want to retain a sterling, a sterling uh, relationship, so they they just get paid in pounds and then convert convert uh, afterwards. Um, lots of that would be much simplified if there was a currency union, and um, uh, I guess the question then would be well. Um, would uh, Scottish pension companies dealing with Scottish uh, pensioners want to buy Scottish bonds or UK bonds, which are both priced in sterling? And then the question is, which of these would be the more attractive? Uh, and... Um, it's an interesting question as to which, which that might be, whether you have to offer premium or whether um, uh, the markets um, take the view that uh, Scottish uh, uh, bonds are, are more um, trustworthy than those of the rest of the UK. Yeah, that was all very interesting, but perhaps I better move on to something a bit more straightforward. Um, <laughs> but perhaps not. I mean, I'm interested in this. Most public service pensions are pay as you go. I take it uh, this is the case, apart from the local government. When correct me if I'm wrong. So, what I mean, what are the implications of that for the payment of pensions post independence, if such a thing were to happen? Well, the so the obligations don't change. I, you know, it, independence doesn't have that effect. Um, so. The public sector not net debt, which is what discussions about how the overall Scottish debt might be allocated, doesn't include public se sector pension obligations. They are included in the uh, even more esoteric whole of government accounts. Um, and I think they amount to around 85 uh, billion. So these have to, these you know, our commitments that one would assume are cast iron commitments and, uh, and have to be met in the future. The, the question is whether the capacity of uh, the Scottish economy within the UK economy is better able to meet these commitments compared with a Scottish economy on its own. And I, I mean, I think this comes back to a point that I was making uh, that, that I have made in the paper which is relevant for a number of these discussions and that is that if, if you're looking at the extent to which pension commitments, welfare commitments and so on are a um, or cause problems for the economy depends really on how much these commitments are in relation to GDP so, is it, you know, do they amount to 20% of GDP? Because that will tell you something about the kind of level of taxes that you're going to have to uh, levy and or the amount of other public spending other than these commitments that you are able to make. And what is critical, therefore, is not only the population 
uh, 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 projections, high, a high migration, low migration, whatever. What is absolutely critical is the GDP pro uh, uh, projections. And the uh, Institute for Fiscal Studies and uh, the Treasury are basically making an assumption that productivity growth in the Scottish economy will continue into the future at 2.2%. And if you vary that just a little, downwards it's a disaster, upwards it becomes relatively easy to meet the commitments to the kinds of things that we're, we're discussing today. So, you know, the, the discussion in my mind seems to have focused an awful lot on, these demo, on, the, on the demographic issues rather than a discussion of, well, will Scotland's economic prospects in terms of growth, be better with independence or without independence. I'm, I'm not offering a, a view about that. I'm just saying that I feel the uh, the argument has 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 kind of skated over that issue, which is ver uh, vitally important. I mean, I suppose I, I, I'm partly interested in in the. I suppose there's seeming contradiction between pay as you go and national insurance, because Anne Flynn's paper implies that there's some national insurance fund that pays for pensions, but in fact that's, that's a fiction, is it not? Is it not a pay-as-you-go pension, the state pension? Uh, sorry, can I just... Yeah. What I was meaning by that was that the, state pen, the level of state pension that is paid to you is based on your national insurance record as opposed to a national insurance fund. So it, it wasn't saying it was funded, it was more saying that your national insurance contribution history drives the amount of pension you get paid. But, yeah. you, but you also say the UK government w would make... I don't know what you mean by make this available. You mean the information available? Well, I think, I think th th there is a... For me, the, the, the entitlement state pension doesn't change. If somebody's paid their national insurance contributions, whether it's part of the UK or th then moving into an independent Scotland, that that commitment remains. But it's how it's, it's, it's Whoever funded. the government's in Scotland has to deliver that. Yes, it has Sorry, to deliver on that. Sorry, just for clarity on that yeah. point. So, oh, well, good. We're all agreed on that. So, um, I suppose, just finally, going back to... Well, not almost finally... Uh, I mean, it's been well discussed already, but, but I think, I mean, it sounds as if there is some agreement on this idea of looking at pension expenditure per working age individual, because it, it seems to me that at the end of the day, um, Chris Curry and Professor Bell both presented the same view on that. I don't know if you have a view on that, but uh, I mean, I, I, and then we're, we're reduced to, which is why we've had a long discussion about uh, demographics, because the only way that you can shift that ratio um, presumably is by increasing the, the working age uh, population. I mean, it's, 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 is there kind of general agreement that that is the best way in which to look at the affordability of the state pension? I, yeah, I definitely agree with that. I think yeah. increasing the, the, the working population mm. and, and, you know, the next stage on from that is getting more and more of the younger working population to contribute to private pension, which auto enrolment is encouraging. So, in a sense, a discussion about pensions very easily morphs into a discussion about immigration, as we've already Absolutely, seen. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, so, I suppose the only, I suppose to me, it seems that um, certain people, probably including the Scottish government, are actually placing too much faith on uh, immigration because there does seem to me to be a contradiction between a significantly different uh, immigration policy and and the wish to remain part of the the common travel area. I mean, I don't think the Republic of Ireland, for example, has a significantly different immigration policy from the rest of the UK. Otherwise, no doubt there wouldn't be a common travel area, but uh, I don't know. It probably takes you out of strictly pension territory, but that's where the argument this morning seems to have proceeded. I mean, you know, immigration to a large extent is not, con is not control. Net immigration is really not controllable. You cannot stop people leaving if they want to leave. Um, but uh, actually, there were high levels of immigration into Ireland um, in the 90s and early 2000s, and that was mainly driven by high economic growth. So, you know, if you have this economic growth, in a sense, you create opportunities for people to come to uh, an economy that, that, that's attractive uh, to join. So. These things are not themselves even unrelated. You know, you can't just have a very liberal immigration policy and necessarily expect people to roll up 
unless there are the economic opportunities for them uh, to, uh, to uh, engage in work. But you could have deferential migration from the European Union or from the rest of the UK in the event of independence. I mean, driven just by differences in economic growth. That, that, I think that's possible. Sorry, Chris, I, 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 do you want to comment on any of the things I've said? Sorry, I, mean, I, I, I just I, have one. Just I've been one. agreeing with you, which is why I didn't really no, have that's, any hard that's, questions. That's always good to hear. Uh, it, just just a, a final thought about the uh, pension expenditure per working age individual that we've been looking at and we've agreed as, as at the moment is the best measure we think we have of looking at, at affordability and differences. Uh, there are two ways to change it. One we've just been talking about is increasing the working age population. The other is changing the, the, the level themselves of pensioner benefits or so how much you pay pensioners and, the, and the, the, the relative generosity of the system. But increasing the, the, the relative size of the working age population, there's two ways of doing that. One is migration, which we've been talking on. The other one is the state pension age. If you increase the state pension age, you increase the working age population, reduce the pensioner population. So it's worth bearing in mind there are a range of different things which could be done to, to change that particular measure. I suppose there is one final question. Um, are there any issues about cross-border pension schemes apart from the one that Anne Flynn raised in her paper and in her comment? The only one to which I have no solution whatsoever <laughs> is, uh, is how uh, overseas pensions are dealt with. So the DWP uh, provides uh, retirement pensions to um, large numbers, I've forgotten about a million possibly, um, UK pensioners who live abroad. How many of these are Scots and how many of them generated uh, national insurance uh, eligibility while in working in Scotland, I think might be a, a test too far for the uh, national insurance record. So I have no idea how that would be solved. Just ring fence then. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you. Gavin's returned. Thank you. Michael, to be followed by John. Um, I wanted to move on to the area of the Pension Protection Fund. Um, I'm not sure who would be best to answer that. I'll leave it up to yourselves. My understanding is at the present time there are around 16,000 people in Scotland who are receiving the, pe the, the pensions that they previously were entitled to, to through the, the Pension Protection Fund. Um, the highest profile case that I can think of is the Waterford Crystal um, situation. I see Anne Flynn nodding, so obviously um, it's, it's something that you're aware of. Um, in, in that situation, my understanding is that the employees in Ireland are still fighting to get their uh, pension fund uh, recovered. But in the UK, where there were employees of that company, they're being paid out of this uh, pension uh, protection fund. Who would pay for a similar situation like that in an independent Scotland? Well, I think it's, it's, it's another one of these quite complex situations, but you know, to date, UK companies have been paying levies to the Pension Protection Fund to fund that fund to help schemes that have gone into difficulty and pay the pensions. So that's covered UK citizens. So in an independent Scotland, the question is whether we would have a Scottish Pension Protection Fund and collect levies from Scottish companies. But uh, there's still the argument, as I mentioned earlier, you've got an awful lot of UK companies that operate in Scotland. So how do we then treat them in terms of protect, pension protection fund? Do they contribute to the, the main UK pension protection fund? And there's an allowance made for the fact they have Scottish um, or employees who are citizens of Scotland and need to be um, looked after in that sense. But it is a very complex area. Um, and um, I think you're right. The, that example of Waterford Crystal with the Irish... Uh, employees are still trying to, or pensioners are still trying to get their benefits. I'm acting for somebody at the moment who was a member of a Scottish DB pension scheme, and um, they have, they, you know, in their mid 80s, are being told they're having £13,000 clawed back because their scheme's gone to pension protection fund. So it, it, it's certainly not an ideal um, organisation as it stands, I would argue. But it, it, yes, I, I do agree. That it's, it's there's a complexity here that I'm not sure we've got the right. We know the solution yet. My follow-up question to that then would be, so what sort of level does the business tax levy uh, come in at uh, in relation to this? What type of companies pay this? What obligation do they have to pay it? 
And is there anything in the, the Scottish Government's white paper that deals with this, how they would resolve those types of issues? I don't recall seeing detail in the Scottish the white paper, but um, yes, currently, I mean, Scottish companies will pay a levy towards the, the Pension Protection Fund through their registration with the pen, pensions regulator. I can't remember the exact uh, levels of levy. I don't know if... No. It's per, is it per member, I think? There's a, there's a per capita, per member kind of levy that they pay every year. Um, and that then is held by the PPF, and if they, they run into difficulties, they then assess to see whether they can be taken into the PPF and the pensions subsequently paid. So. Could you give us a, a sort of ballpark figure of, as to how much the, the Pension Protection Fund is paying out to those 16,000 Scots at the present time? I'm afraid I don't know that. So no. I, could, I could certainly find out for you. Could you do that and, and inform us? That would be helpful. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. Thank you uh, uh, for that, Michael. Deputy Convener. Uh, thanks, uh, Convener. Um, covered quite a lot of ground already. Um, j just on a, a factual issue, uh, Ms Flynn, on the front page of your uh, paper, you say, um, I would argue that the existing legislation could be replicated to redefine the classifications for Scotland. I mean, my right in thinking that if, if we did get independence, all existing UK legislation would still apply to the independent Scotland and we'd only need, we wouldn't need to replicate anything in the sense of actually reenacting legislation, but it would just be if we wanted to change something, we'd need to do that. Um, again, I would maybe being a bit um, bold in my paper there, but um, I, I do believe, having spoken to some um, people on the legal side, that some of the primary legislation written in the UK would have to be reenacted in Scotland. That is my understanding. That may have changed. Um, at the point of writing that, that was my understanding. So, for example, the one I used earlier was salary sacrifice, that that would have to be reenacted in for an independent Scotland. Oh, I'm interested in that. I don't know if the other witnesses have any view on that. You don't have a view on it. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's certainly it's something that, that um, you know, I took part in a debate a wee while ago, and that was the lawyers in the debate were all advocating that that would have to be the case. But as I say, I don't know. Okay, we'll maybe look at that again because I mean I think under other countries have left the UK and have uh, sure. <laughs> uh, kept the same most of the same legislation. Yeah, Fair enough. I think you would just replicate it, reenact it, but replicate it. Yeah. Okay. Right, well, I'll leave that one just now. That's okay. fair enough. Um, the, the whole co this whole concept of uh, you spend one third of your life in retirement after you're age twenty. So I gather, if I'm correct, that then if you were expected to live 60 years, you'd basically have 40 years working and 20 years retired. Where does that one-third come from? I can try and answer, answer that one. Uh, it's, it, it's really based on observation of what's been happening uh, in the UK over a, a number of years, where what we found is state pension age hasn't been increasing, but life expectancy has been increasing. Uh, and whereas... Uh, if you take it right back to the early parts of the 20th century, actually living to receive a state pension was somewhat unusual because uh, the state pension age was set higher than life expectancy. Uh, we've, we've obviously seen it becoming more and more frequent that people are spending more and more uh, uh, or longer and longer uh, relative of their, their adult life uh, actually in retirement as opposed to the amount of time working. Now, uh, we have done work on this in the past. I'm afraid I can't remember the precise figures, but actually having a third of working age is, is kind of roughly where we've, we've got to in terms of kind of the, the, the situation at the moment with the state pension age changes going through at the moment in the UK. Uh, and so the idea being really is to try and keep it at that particular level and make sure that any future uh, increases in life expectancy are, are shared out in that particular way. So of any extra year, two thirds of the year would go on to the amount of time you spend working and one third of, the, of that extra year goes in terms uh, of spending it in retirement. Uh, I don't think there's any real uh, detailed research behind it as to that being the ideal split between the amount of time you spend working and the amount of time you spend retirement in retirement. I think it's probably a function of a number of different features, such as that's not far off where we are at the moment, or at least have been in the, in the relative past. Uh, there are also obviously affordability issues in there that kind of the ratio between those two has a very big impact on how much you spend on pension benefits and how much you collect in national insurance and taxation. And is it a rough and ready figure that's kind of appeared or was there some detailed no, mathematical I, uh, model behind no, it? I, I don't think there's a detailed math mathematical model. I think uh -huh. it's just based on experience. That's roughly where we are. It's Therefore, not, the UK or Scotland could kind of vary it a bit. 
one percent, two percent, whatever. Yeah, yeah. completely. Uh, that they use, uh, they don't always use the same type of, of ratios in other countries. Uh, the one that, that springs to mind, uh, I think, is Denmark, where they've actually set a fixed number of years in retirement as the basis for changing their state pension age. So, as a consequence, their state pension age is increasing much more, much more rapidly uh, than it would do here. I think on the basis that people should expect to spend about fourteen years at the end of their life in retirement. So there are different ways of looking at it. So if you lived 100, you worked till you're 86, kind of thing? Well, if, if the average was up to 100, <laughs> then their state pension age would be 86. Uh, but it's expected to reach the mid-70s, I think, by the middle of this century. OK. I mean, that does kind of lead me on to my next point, because you know I, I, we have such a range of jobs, and it's one thing for us to sit around the table and talk to each other. But, I mean, for nurses, for teachers, for firemen, where it's a very physical job, I mean, is it fair to have this a kind of across-the-board uh, theory or policy or age or whatever, or should we be varying it more? That's a, a very big philosophical question, uh, in a way, but also a very important practical question. Uh, and I think it, it, it relates partly to the, the conversation or the discussion we had with the convener right at the start of the session uh, about that there being a fixed pension age and that obviously having different implications depending on your own particular, particular characteristics. Uh, your own expectation of life rather than, than basing it on the average because I think as you quite rightly point out there are lots of variations around the average in fact there are probably very few people who actually end up having exactly the average life expectancy most people are above or below that uh, I think one of the the rationale in having a fixed pension age is is the the simplicity of people then understanding when they're likely to to be stopping well not necessarily stopping working but able to to receive a state pension and I think it also goes back to what the rationale is for having a state pension. Uh, in its kind of starkest terms, the state pension is there uh, really uh, as an insurance against living to old age and not being able to provide for yourself. Uh, now, there have been other definitions in, in the past, and in particular, I think, uh, when the state pension was introduced in its current form uh, with national insurance, although national insurance is... Is, is kind of trying to highlight the insurance element of it, but is also kind of felt to be a right that I'm paying in my national insurance contributions as part of that, and so I get a, a return on those contributions that I've paid in. So uh, I, I think you've, you've highlighted a very important fact that any fixed state pension age gives different outcomes to different people. Uh, I think the difficulty is in finding an alternative to that which would be simple enough to allow people to, to have some certainty as to when they might be reaching their state pension age and be able to, to claim a state pension and how they could then use that in planning their other affairs in, in, in levels of saving they might need to, to have or, or how long they may or may not be able to work for. I don't know, Ms Flynn, from a kind of practical point of view, if you've got a view on that, I mean, is it just that we've really got to have a uniform system uh, from a practical point of view even if you know a nurse having to lift people till she's 70 is actually in practice quite difficult. Yeah, I, th I think it, it is a significant issue for um, employers, whether local authority or private companies. They have people that are involved in physical work. And the fact that we have the um, age discrimination legislation as well, so you, you can't actually make, force somebody to retire either, but they could be in not, not, not good enough health to continue working, but they can't get their state pension is an issue. So I, I actually agree with you that we, it would be good if we ha could have some variation depending on the actual occupation um, and allowing you know, flexibility in terms of state pension again the complexity of that and what it would cost and administrating it is, is the issue that we'd have to look at but I do, I do advocate that I think there are people that have to finish their working lives earlier um, and should be entitled to some, some form of state pension at an earlier age okay. I mean, again, some of the kind of bigger picture, I mean, we're looking very much at really what's happening now and what might happen in the future. But if we look at the past as well, I mean, when I was growing up, a lot of people worked for a company or a business and there was a pretty good, or I, my impression is there was a pretty good company pension scheme, usually defined a benefits. And my father worked his whole life for Scottish Power and my mother seems to do OK off the benefit kind of thing, eh, off the pension. Um, I mean, was that a good, was that a bad model that we've happily moved away from and should never think of going back to? Or was that a good model that actually the UK system has deteriorated from and we should try and improve either the UK or the Scottish system? I mean, I think it, 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 it's, it's certainly a different model. Uh, and there are, there, there are certain things which, which I think we have to, to bear in mind. Firstly, uh, 
although there have in the past been very good defined benefit pension schemes, uh, outside of the public sector, they've never covered the majority of people in work. Uh, even at their peak, it was really probably just about 50% of the working population that were covered. But that's certainly on a UK context. And I don't know the, the, the Scotland-specific figures uh, in all of that. But you're right, where people were covered, they were covered very well with, uh, which looking back now appear to be relatively generous pension schemes. Having said that, they changed significantly during the 1970s with a number uh, of uh, regulations coming in over time to increase the security uh, and add to the value of those benefits. So, for example, allowing uh, for pensions not to be eroded by inflation, uh, allowing for the provision of uh, spouses' benefits uh, as part of that, uh, equal treatment regulations coming in as well during the, the, the 1980s, uh, it, which means that actually there never was a particular point in time when the system was stable enough. It was always continually changing and uh, over the past 20, 30 years or so has improved the security and increased the value of the benefits in offer through those particular types of pension schemes. In that a lot of people now who 30 years ago would have been had a pretty good pension have now got a poorer pension in practice? Uh, it, it means that people who had a pension 30 years ago have still got a good pension because the legislation has protected that. It means that far fewer people now are being offered those types of pensions because, as well as the protection increasing, the cost of providing those pensions to an employer has increased as well. Uh, and again, I think it's, it's, it's more than doubled over that particular period in time, uh, at least again in the overall UK context. And that's driven employer behaviour. Uh, they have found that they are, are no longer able to afford to make those contributions. Uh, the, the kind of increase in global competition has meant that there's been a, a, a real issue uh, on labour force costs, not just wages, but also the additional benefits which are being paid. And so it's been a, a transform transformation over a period of time, and it really started probably, uh, I think, as the Pensions Commission pointed out, 15, 20 years ago that kind of employers started to move away from this type of, of provision uh, and to take on a provision which for them holds less risk and is potentially less expensive but shifts the risk and the cost onto the individual uh, and that's really where we are at the moment in, in a UK context and also in an inter international context in terms of much more of the responsibility for private pensions being placed on the individual even if the employer makes a contribution they're no longer responsible, for example, for the investment performance. They're no longer taking on the, the risk of these individuals living for a, for a long time. That's now being passed to the individual who has to deal with it. It sounds themselves. to me like the individual's getting a, a poorer deal now than they used to be. I mean, I accept not every individual, but certainly some individuals. Mm. Uh, um, sorry, Ed, go on. Um, no, I mean, I, I can see exactly where you're coming from. I mean, I, I go back long enough in this industry that I started off in what was known as final salary pensions where people actually got a pension based on the salary they were earning in the last year, um, and then saw repeated changes to legislation, as Chris mentioned, which layered on complexity and cost to these, these, these pensions. Um, and as a result, a lot of employers stepped back from them. But equally, a lot of employers enjoyed what they called um, contribution holidays in the 1990s, under advice from actuaries. Uh, and you could look at that and pinpoint that as a, a significant turning point in the that the provision of that type of benefit as well. But the overcomplexity of legislation and regulation definitely, I, I would say, was the death knell for defined benefit pensions. I think the thing that concerns me in the example I mentioned earlier is that um, even those that were in a good pension scheme 30 years ago, if that pension scheme is now in, uh, within the PPF, th those people that are pensioners are actually having money clawed back from them, which is quite concerning too. So, you know, it is, it's, there is a switch to defined contribution provision, which the onus sits on the individual. And yes, I, I agree. Passing that risk on to the individual is quite significant. And that's where I advocate the whole engagement education piece is so important that people make the right choices and actually end up in the right place. And at the moment, I would say our industry isn't very good at that. Helping them. I mean, is it too simplistic to say that if, if people are in some kind of pooled, like what used to be a company scheme or a local authority scheme where it's pooled and the risk is pooled, that's generally going to be better for the individual than if they just have their individual pot? We've moved to a very individualistic system, haven't we? Yeah, I mean, it is a very individual system at the moment, although you, if, you looked, if, you, if you lift the lid on it, a lot of people invest in the same fund. So there is a level of pooling to some extent already. What, what I think the latest reform proposals are is to make that a more overt pooling of risk, which does make it safer, but you also then can 
you run the risk of the with profits sort of phenomenon where you've got people that are benefiting um, and being cross-subsidised by others within that pool. Um, so it, it has downsides as well. Okay. Um, Professor Bell, you make the point about you know, what's funded and what's unfunded. And if I'm reading your paper correctly, the Scottish uh, local government is considerably better funded. I mean, you're showing 25 billion, is it, of assets, I think, and 78 billion in the UK. So that's, we've got about a third of all the local government assets, which is, I was quite taken aback to actually see that. Um, I mean, does it actually, well, is that the case, maybe? And I mean, it, does it matter whether we're, we're doing fun, funded schemes or a unfunded schemes going forward? I mean, the UK obviously has this mixture. Do we just live with that or should we be changing that? Uh, not an easy thing to change because yes. to go to a funded scheme from an unfunded yes, scheme is really, really, really uh, d difficult. Um, the, uh, the question is, I mean, who is, who, who's bearing the costs of this? So with the um, pay-as-you-go type arrangement, it's got the current uh, employees and employers are pay paying the pensions of those who um, uh, are currently receiving pensions, whereas with the funded schemes, these... Um, pensioners have made contributions in the past which when invested have generated a fund that broadly perhaps with some uh, uh, support from the taxpayer uh, uh, um, effectively repays their contributions so I mean in general um, uh, funded schemes uh, are to be recommended but of course you know what is the re you've got to think about what are the returns on the invested funds we've, we've lived through a period where where for example uh, interest rates have been very low so uh, uh, funds invested haven't in in cash or near cash have not done that well so um <coughs> it's a bit of it is a bit of a trade-off but certainly the uk turns out to be um one of the countries that has done most towards funding. Early on in my paper, I say that the UK has the largest, second largest um, pension asset, set of pension asset funds uh, in the world, uh, following only the US. So the, there is a considerable level of saving, that's effectively what it is, uh, by the UK uh, population and Scottish population, obviously, in, in pension funds, which, which will generate future income. In the case the Scottish local authority pension funds were better funded as a percentage of their liabilities than the English ones were. I don't know if you can confirm if that's still the case. or I'm not sure what the no. current position is. That's fair enough. And, and the final area I wanted to kind of touch on was the whole thing about uh, you know, equality, rich and poor, and so on. I mean, uh, I think, again, your paper, Professor Bell, um, says that 55% of people in Scotland are saving adequately, which sounds like good news. Um, I'm a wee bit worried about the 45% that aren't saving adequately. I mean, where is UK current pension policy going? Is it, is it helping the people at the bottom? Or is it, are we actually moving towards the people who have both finances, income, and financial education to do better for themselves while the people at the bottom get left behind? Um, Sure, my colleagues will, will um, have views on that. I mean, the auto enrolment is is a major innovation. It seems to me, and 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 bringing people into the pensions, um, the ambit of, of 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 having an investment in a pension uh, than than uh, was uh, previously the case. So that helps the relatively poorly paid to some extent. It does seem to me, uh, and going back to previous questions, that um, the, um, at the bottom of the income distribution, where people, through globalisation, through uh, technical change, for whatever reason, are not uh, earning uh, very high levels of salary, um, uh, so it reflects the level of inequality in, you know, that, that exists within Scotland and, and within the UK as a whole, that that group um, are unlikely to be able to save sufficiently to be able to have 
been an adequate type pension uh, post-retirement and that they therefore will be uh, dependent on the state pension and other and other benefits and you shouldn't forget actually that um, in terms of benefits the past 10 15 years has seen the the kind of um, balance of DWP spending move more and more towards pensioner benefits and away from working age benefits so it tends to be working age benefits that are really being squeezed whereas things like pensions so for example working age benefits fall within the 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 benefits cap which the uh, which the chancellor has recently talked about whereas uh, uh, benefits for older people have tended to uh, increase and things like the triple lock which some view as unaffordable will protect uh, those relatively poor uh, pensioners who maybe haven't had the opportunity uh, to uh, to save during their working lives at least post retirement but yeah, I understand you're saying there's been a bit, bit of a move towards pensioners as a whole. So yes. I, don't, I don't know if the other two witnesses could comment on that. I mean, do you see present pension policy in the UK would mean a widening gap between those that have and those that don't? For me, uh, what I've observed in the past year, two years, is there's a specific group, and I'm one of them, uh, and there's not many of us in the room, but women in particular, within the auto-enrolment regulations, it's quite interesting because it's mainly women that are part-time workers. Uh, they're on lower salaries, and they quite often fall below the earnings benchmark for auto enrolment. So then they're not they're not participating in that that saving. So and they're, and you know the, their employer is obliged to offer them to join if they want to, but without that element of compulsion and being brought in and this sort of um, just it happening to them. So I I genuinely have a concern that we're going to see a growing problem with women who work part-time, take career breaks, etc., still having big gaps in pension provision. I'm not exa exactly sure of the, the solution, but I definitely think employers should be, be asked to consider if somebody's falling below a certain um, earnings level, the employer should be asked to consider actually contributing on their behalf to at least get them started in the savings pattern. But, you know, that, that's, that's a, an issue that's close to my heart at the moment. Having, having witnessed a number of large employers uh, auto-enrolling their staff and seeing the majority of exclusions being women. That's mm -hmm. helpful, thanks. Mm -hmm. Uh, just to, to kind of put it in context, I think that uh, pensioner poverty in the UK as a whole has dropped significantly in the past 15 years or so. Uh, initially, mainly as a, as a consequence of the pension credit uh, and helping people who, who hadn't done very well from either the state pension system or uh, the private pension system in the UK, uh, pension credit was very good at bringing them up to at least the, the kind of level of pensioner, pensioner poverty, uh, which is very close, incidentally, to the current guarantee credit level. So I think also the single tier pension being introduced and having that set above the guaranteed credit level is also likely to maintain that kind of poverty prevention part of the UK pension system. And I think if you look at who really loses out most from the introduction of a single tier pension, it would be people who are uh, relatively consistent high earners through their working life who would have built up very high second tier pensions. Uh, so I think you can see that the, the, the thrust of policy, at least in state pension terms, is to focus resources uh, among people who, uh, or, or, uh, among the lower earners, I think, to make sure they stay out of poverty and really to give everybody a flat base. Now, from that, you can see that if what you're trying to achieve is everybody having a relatively good standard of living in retirement related to the standard of living they had while they were working, you actually get the low earners much closer to that through this single tier state pension policy than through the continuation of the, the previous policy. Uh, I think it's right, though, there are that uh, I think both Azan and, and David have alluded to, there are gaps uh, in, in that. Uh, and I think, interestingly, it's probably not the very low earners who are likely to, to find it hardest to get a, a, a decent income in retirement. It's probably people just above that. Uh, the work that we've done suggests they need to save more than the minimum 8% uh, of band earnings contributions in order to have a, an adequate retirement income. Uh, and interestingly, the higher your earnings are, the higher the contribution is you need to make in order to do that because the flat rate pension 
it doesn't reward those higher earners anymore in the same way that the, the previous system did. But actually, the higher earners are probably more likely to be able to afford that. It's probably people kind of not on low earnings but on high earnings in the middle who will probably struggle to be able to make the additional contributions they need, won't be able to build up other forms of saving that they can rely on in retirement, uh, and so may have to find uh, other ways and, and may potentially... It, it could be uh, households where there's a couple where, where one person is automatic enrolled if the if one partner is working part-time and isn't automatically enrolled then that ends up in potentially reducing the the amount they have saved so uh, I, I would say it is focused on keeping low earners out of poverty but there may be more to be done uh, for people just above that level in order to make sure they can have a decent retirement income okay thanks so much thanks Jean. two quick questions really one is the um the relationship between national insurance contribution and pensions being paid out. I mean, is there, in fact, no relationship there at all? I mean, we talk, we talk about people being able to contribute. Uh, some people, of course, contribute more to NIC than the maximum limit in order to achieve their pension because they work longer. But other people are invited sometimes to pay. They're behind by £3.50 pence or something. But, in fact, is that all... A, a bit of a myth. Um, there's no, there's no fun there. You know, the, there are issues around eligibility, but I mean, what we've now got, and the IFS has criticised this, is um, an income tax in all but name uh, for uh, national insurance, and politicians that are unwilling, really, to raise the headline rate of income tax but are willing to make adjustments to national insurance and um, whereas you um, might attempt to um, simplify the way that income tax has been uh, or is being set by say making the personal allowance £10,000 which is part of government UK government policy uh, the, nat the national insurance system uh, for the, uh, on the individual side, indeed for the employer's side, is, is, is very complicated and you would hope actually that uh, someone, whether it's an independent Scotland or, or the UK government, might find a way of, of trying to stop this charade that, that this is in some sense a contribution towards your national insurance, but rather that this is part of your overall income tax uh, liability. And that would be something that small employers would welcome enormously if it would make their life much easier uh, than dealing with uh, two different deductions of tax. I think that's true. I mean, I think politicians underestimate how concerned smaller employers are about all of these issues, including... The, the both national insurance and income tax. And um, can I ask you about any observations on companies that register uh, overseas and therefore are ineligible to pay national insurance contributions and who employ people in this country? I'm not quite sure um, uh, what category of company you're thinking about, but I mean, there have been some well-publicised examples uh, in, uh, in recent months where, where issues around eligibility for uh, uh, kind of local taxation has come up, and, and it seems to me that the only way to solve that has to be cross-national. Um, the, there has to be an agreement that that uh, tax havens or uh, jurisdictions in which which are being used effectively to create um, what what to, might seem to most people fictional transactions um, uh, are are outlawed in some way or another. But I'm not a tax expert, so I, I can't tell you how how that might happen. No, sorry, it's not. And. Um, <clears throat> I guess, finally, it's just it, it, it does seem that um, in an independent Scotland, there might be um, difficult as it may be, but there, it seems to me that there's a real opportunity to redesign uh, the tax system to, first of all, perhaps 
uh, counter some of these defects that exist um, and to, to make it much simpler, in spite of the complications that are, that are referred to in the various papers about e extracting uh, responsibilities and, and uh, the current practices from the UK system. But the system isn't working particularly well. Would you agree that there's that there's an opportunity that exists as well as uh, the, the complications that clearly are there, inherent in that? Clearly, uh, there are difficulties around um, the structure of, of taxation at the moment, and uh, uh, I would recommend people to read the Merrilee's report which is a bit technical, but the, produced by the Institute for Fiscal Studies, which looks at the UK tax system and points out some of the difficulties. Um, um, things like the taxation of property, uh, which is rather strange. Um, uh, and also the way in which it sets up incentives for, for individuals and companies uh, to take actions which are maybe about taxation rather than the economic benefit uh, uh, of, the com of the country. The only thing I would, well, so that in principle is available. The only thing I would say is that um, clearly it couldn't happen in the short term and that it would inevitably, there would be transitional costs to move from a system that we currently have um, to one which is radically uh, radically different. And you have to bear in mind, too, that um, uh, a redesigned system also has to uh, pay attention to not only the kind of incentives that are set up within the Scottish economy, but also any incentives that might affect, for example, migration between Scotland and the rest of the UK. If, if it looked like taxes were advantageously designed in Scotland. You might get large numbers of people coming to Scotland, um, which might or might not be a good thing, or the flow could be the other way. So uh, what I guess um, uh, I'm saying is that, yes, in principle, uh, a, a redesigned tax system might be a good idea. There would undoubtedly be transitional costs, and you would finally have to pay attention to the kind of uh, tax regime uh, that was in uh, operation in your close neighbours. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. That's concluded questions from the committee. I've just got a couple of short questions for Professor Bell specifically. And it's just that... Um, in your paper, uh, Funding Pensions in Scotland with Independence Matter, published in February 2014, you pointed out, of course, as we've already discussed, that the UK government has no plans to vary um, pensions by country, you know, the state uh, pension age. But you said in that that um, this was actually unfair to Scotland. So do you think, actually, that uh, we should have the ability to set our own state pension age in Scotland? So this, I mean, goes back to a question I think that was asked of Chris. Um, I mean, so in an ideal, well, I don't know whether it would be an ideal world, but what you'd like to do is, to, in, you might like to do, is to, is to design pensions so that, in effect, uh, everyone got an individual assessment uh, of their life expectancy and paid contributions accordingly. So that would have to take in a huge amount of, uh, of issues. Now, uh, <laughs> I asked you a pretty straightforward question. I was hoping for a pretty straightforward answer. Well, well I mean, so you could vary, you could vary it by um, uh, location. You could, so, but then would there be a, a question of should actually the state pension age be different within Scotland? Because, as Chris said, uh, I, I suspect that, that given current statistics, it should be much greater in Orkney than it is in Glasgow. Um, there, are, there are other factors that determine life expectancy. Ethnicity 
is a factor that, that does tend to uh, be reflected in uh, differences in mortality rates. You could certainly you can make this case, but it doesn't seem to me to be an overwhelming case because there are ways in which you could equally argue that that you could vary the um, uh, state retirement age, other than simply by territory within the UK. So that's my ducking and diving. Did you say it was actuarially unfair to Well, it, it, in a sense it is, uh, because uh, what an actuary would do is to, is to look at everyone's individual circumstances and design the, a, a pension that was appropriate for, for that person. If they were a smoker, then maybe a more generous pension uh, would be available than if they were a non-smoker, and, and so on. So the statement was correct. The question is, is, you know, would that be a desirable policy overall? Or is it simpler to have people just know that in relation to, to um, my working life, this is, is, is where uh, or when I can expect to get to receive uh, a state pension? Okay. Just one final point, basically. I mean, you've done a lot of work on demographic challenges, and we've talked about dem demography quite a lot here, obviously. Um, and Scotland doesn't really have a lot of the tools in order to address those issues, um, you know, whether it's immigration, fiscal incentives, etc. Um, I mean, if Scotland can't uh, tackle these issues directly, can you see the ageing um, population situation relative to the rest of the UK getting worse in Scotland? Um, uh the, uh, currently, the demographic projections taken at face value would suggest that uh, Scotland would have a relatively more, uh, well, would be devoting a higher proportion of its GDP to the support of older people. That essentially is the Institute for Fiscal Studies case. There's a raft of assumptions that many of which we've, we've discussed, many of which are, 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 are uh, um, uh, contestable uh, around that. So at face value, it's true. One of the things that I wonder, and I've mentioned before, is that if you look at Europe in terms of the challenges faced by um, an ageing population, the, yeah, yeah, the, much, the much UK worse. is actually in the most favourable position in, in Europe, along with Ireland. Um, Germany, Italy, Greece ha are going to face much, much greater challenges. And so um, the long-run projections, say, for the German economy are actually fairly poor on the basis that uh, by 2040, I think it is, there will be, for every working pension, uh, there will be half a pensioner. In Scotland, you know, in terms of European Union countries, if you look at the, the other European Union yeah. countries, we'd be in the, the better half rather than the bottom half in terms of demographic true. projections. Okay, we'll, we'll leave it at there. Actually. Okay, well, thank you very much. Actually, I'd like to thank our witnesses for the, the evidence that they've given today. It was uh, very helpful. And I'd also like to thank colleagues for their questions. We decided earlier on that we take the next two items in private. I'd therefore like to close the public uh, um, session and uh, have a couple of minutes um, of a, a break in order to allow the official report and our witnesses to leave. <laughs>